که باید همین بخواست So welcome to this MBZI uh, Ricking AIP joint workshop. So um, uh, Professor Masashi Sugiyama is visiting us. Masashi is the director of uh, Ricking uh, Center for Advanced Intelligence uh, Project, AIP. Um, we know Ricking AIP is very strong in AI. At the same time, MBZI, <coughs> under the leadership of the President Eric King and our provost, Tim Baldwin um, is uh, growing amazingly fast, both in terms of the size and quality. Right? So, in uh, Masashi proposal to have this workshop to cover a number of research directions in the big field of AI. In, uh, uh, you know, nowadays, we have separate conferences and workshops in ALP, uh, computer vision, and machine learning. But generally, there are very rare opportunities for us to see this state of art across major research domains in, uh, in the field of AI. So today, as you can see from the list of speakers, we hope this workshop is a, such a platform um, uh, to exchange ideas, provide a big picture of AI to our participants, and uh, inspire new ideas and collaborations for written people and also uh, for us. So, and uh, we also hope this will provide kind of some new opportunities to collaborate. And um, uh, thank you very much, Masashi, Tong Liang, and uh, Chi Bin Zhou from Riken, and uh, Philip, and others for making this workshop happen. And uh, so now, uh, Masashi, would you like to say a few yeah. words about the workshop? Okay, good morning, everybody, and good, good, good morning in here, and good afternoon in Japan. So first of all, thank you very much, Kun and all other members in BZI for inviting us and organizing this great workshop. So as introduced, Recan AIP is a national project of like AI and machine learning. We started in 2016. So this is already the eighth year. I think we have quite grown a lot in the last eight years. Then MBZI, so it's a new university, and I see this name quite a lot in many conferences. I was so much excited about that. And finally, I had the chance to come here and meet people here. It's a great opportunity. So I think in Japan, still not a lot of people have experience in Abdali. So it was like a quite good opportunity for me to come here and really meet here and have an online workshop like this. So hope that today is a nice starting point to and get to know each other and try to find some common topics. Hope that we can have joint projects in the near future. So enjoy the workshop. Thank you. We hope to see more kind of bringing people here and so we can host our people, right? And we can have uh, even joint MDI and drinking researchers. Wonderful. And now, um, let's just give the stage to our exciting speakers. And uh, for now, we'd like to get a presentation. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to share the first half session. And uh, first of all, please allow me to introduce you the first speaker. Professor Tim Kelvin. So, uh, Professor Tim is the provost of, uh, for academic affairs, and uh, he is also the uh, department chair for LP. Uh, his research in interests include deep learning, <coughs> algorithmic fairness, and uh, computational social science, and so on. And, uh, before joining MBGUI, Professor Tim Beldwin is a <coughs> professor in Melbourne for 17 years. And uh, he was the uh, Melbourne Laureate Professor there. Also, he was the Director for ARC Training Center for Cognitive uh, Computing and also the uh, Associate Dean for the Melbourne School of uh, Engineering. Now, welcome Professor Tim Godwin give us a talk. The title is Marrying and uh, Improving Fairness in NLP. Welcome. Um, very excited to be part of this workshop. Very excited to welcome the, the Rigid uh, people here. Um, uh, 
more people coming and going between our uh, institutions, as I was saying to the CEO of the yesterday. I've actually visited Rigen a couple of times in the NLP space. I have strong connections there. Um, uh, one thing I didn't mention was you actually hosted one of my students at Rigen last year. Um, so that's all I've said there. I had one of my students visiting here. Um, so I'm going to talk about fairness. Uh, um, in NLP is in the title, but the way I've actually structured the talk is it's basically presented as a machine learning talk to try to make it as accessible as possible. So I can cut all of the the NLP details are hidden behind the scenes. Um, so, uh, fairness actually came up in uh, obviously Jonathan said uh, presentation yesterday, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, what it's all about is um, uh, the idea that we have systems that we're building uh, which perform differently for, for different people. And in the extreme case, you actually end up with uh, these um, minimal pairs of uh, you have all of the same features for a given individual with the exception of one protected attribute. Um, so it's some inalienable property of that individual, whether it's something like uh, binary gender, um, age, um, uh, yeah, perhaps their, um, their, their heritage, their background. Uh, and on the basis of that, you have a flip of a label. So examples here are um, Amazon using AI naively to filter out CVs and find that they've got a, a bias towards uh, males. Um, not because of qualifications, but because of gender. Uh, you've got the, the Twitter example with the auto crop algorithm that's used in the, the Twitter uh, web feed. So if Amazon posts an image, you get the auto crop version in your, um, your feed. When you click on it, you see the full version. Uh, but uh, the way uh, it was set up, it uh, tended to prefer faces, which is fine, but younger, whiter, more effeminate, you know, more beautiful uh, faces uh, for use a very tongue-in-cheek uh, um, description from the, um, the student who actually uncovered this as part of a, a Twitter bounty that ran last year. Um, in the NLP context, it can be anything from specific tasks, so you know, something like uh, co-reference resolution and, and hate speech. Um, so hate speech directed at particular demographics uh, performs better than other demographics, say, but all the way down to you know, what seem like uh, completely benign you know, kind of bread and butter tasks like part of speech tagging or even <coughs> Just uh, static embeddings or contextualized embeddings themselves. So, and for me, I guess uh, a large part of my own journey uh, or a big wake up call uh, personally um, was a paper at ACL uh, a couple of years ago, 2017, um, from a, a group at uh, Stanford, so, uh, David Jurgens, who's now at the uh, University of Michigan, uh, was leading this. Um, and it was looking at what seems like a, a very vanilla use case of. Uh, using language identification. So uh, in the context of Twitter, so I've got a, a tweet, is it English or is it not? Um, so it wasn't even low resource language, it was just English, is this English or is it not? The recall over different uh, varieties of English spoken in different countries. So Australian English versus uh, Singaporean English versus uh, Nigerian English, say, and picking up on this uh, very confronting uh, correlation between the Human Development Index of the country of origin that that variety of English is spoken in. So all, all the way on the left, in terms of the, the x-axis, you've got a country like Nigeria, say, um, uh, and the recall of our language ID systems at doing this filtering of tweets to, to just return all of the English uh, uh, content. Um, and yeah, the reason it was so confronting is because the, the blue line at the bottom there is a, a system called language ID I that we we developed uh, more than 10 years ago, I guess now, uh, where you sort of see this horrible rich gets richer sort of demographic as it performed very well for rich English speaking countries and performed very badly, or comparatively very badly for poor English speaking countries. <coughs> One of the official languages is English. Uh, so this rich gets richer di uh, uh, dynamic is something that comes up a lot in the, the fair literature. It tends to be uh, a um, bias towards white male uh, cisgender people from richer countries, uh, which is appalling if we think of AI as an enabler, an accelerant in terms of uh, furthering um, whatever uh, human progress, if it's only people of a very narrow demographic that really benefit from this. Anyway, that's my way of uh, our background, my personal story in terms of how I got involved with this. 
um, just to sort of set the scene in terms of uh, some of the, the concepts I'll be talking about, um, you know, a, a very sort of cartoonish description of a sort of standard NLP pipeline uh, nowadays is you know, you've got some labeled data, um, you train some model, nowadays it's almost certainly going to be a deep learning model, um, you're doing some classification tasks, our, our Ys throughout the talk are going to be our, our target labels. Um, and in the context of fairness, uh, I'll be talking about two uh, different types of fairness, uh, what we call representational fairness, which is fairness with respect to the learned representations in our model. Um, so yeah, we're talking about sort of modern day uh, large language models. Uh, that's the, um, the final layer representation just before our, our classification layer or our, our, our regression layer. Okay, so the idea there is uh, we're using that uh, um, vector that our method has learned for a given instance, and we're trying to uh, do prediction of, aha, is this instance associated with one demographic or another, okay, versus empirical fairness, which is on the output uh, side of things. So in terms of the model predictions, uh, do we observe any disparities uh, with respect to our particular demographics? Okay, so primarily I'll talk about empirical fairness, but uh, representational fairness will sort of come up in a couple of so um, this talk is based around two papers which will be presented next week, in fact, so it's very much hot off the press work. Um, so there's an EACL uh, paper that I will present, and there's an iClear paper in the second half that um, the, the student who's been doing a lot of this work, uh, Shidong, who's unfortunately not here at the moment, he's, he's been visiting, he's back in Melbourne at the moment, uh, uh, will present at, at iClear. Um, so the EACL part of it. So what we were asking in this paper as sort of part of a, a sort of long series of, of papers that we had in this space um, was you know, taking, taking a bit of a step back and saying, okay, uh, yeah, we all sort of run our, our different evaluations over benchmark data sets and we compare our numbers. Uh, but in doing that comparison of numbers, what are the underlying assumptions that we're making? So you know, what is fairness anyway? And as we'll see uh, in a moment, um, there are many, many different mathematical definitions of what fairness is. Uh, and based on your definition, you'll get a, a very different number uh, in terms of what fairness empirically translates to. Then how fair uh, or fairness on, on what terms uh, in terms of how we do our model training and how we do our evaluation. Uh, so uh, you know, we, we like to distill our, our model results down to a single fig figure of merit. Uh, in doing that, we need to have some way of doing aggregation, which sort of seems like a very uh, harmless sort of a thing to do. But it turns out how we do that aggregation has a very big impact on what our numbers uh, end up looking like. So how do we do the aggregation? Um, also, as part of that, uh, um, and you know, possibly in machine learning, there are more uh, tasks where you have this inherent trade-off, this multi-objective optimization task that you're performing in the case of fairness is between raw performance and, and fairness, and you're defining performance and fairness. Performance is usually an accuracy or an F score or whatever. Um, fairness, as we'll see, we can define in, in many different ways. But given that we've got this trade-off, how do we do model selection? What, what is a good model? And again, you, you sort of think, you know, we, we're, we've grown up enough, surely. We, we've matured, we understand machine learning well enough that surely model selection is not a, a big issue, because that's a huge issue. And how you do your model selection has a very big impact on your sort of table of results in terms of what model uh, or what method uh, um, works well. So how can we do model selection in a way uh, which is fair, uh, to quite a term, um, you know, with respect to the distribution of results across this uh, uh, performance fairness uh, um, trade-off boundary. Um, and then along the same lines, if we've got two uh, different models, how can we compare them given that we do have some frontier um, that we're trying to compare? <laughs> so these are the different uh, elements we're trying to cover here. Um, just uh, by way of note, uh, this is one of the few NLB specific slides. Um, so in NLB, we, we tend to make a, um, a differentiation between what we call uh, source or author bias as in uh, who is it who wrote this particular piece of text and what are their predicted attributes? That's what we're going to calculate fairness with respect to. So if you had uh, a snippet from a, a movie review, um, <coughs> such as the one on the slide there, it's an, an adventure which reaches back to golden age Hollywood and the devil may care, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, and I ask you to uh, predict, is this more likely to be male or female? And is it more likely to be a younger or an older person? Uh, I, 
people probably largely agree that it's more likely to be male than female, it's more likely to be an older than a younger person, just based on the, the style, and some of the particular phrasing that they've used. Uh, so th there's nothing explicit there to represent that, but that's the sort of thing that our models pick up on, where we get issues in terms of fairness, even if we're not explicitly exposing these predicted attributes as part of our model training. As a thing from target bias, where it's all about who am I referring to and what are their predicted attributes. Um, so an example of that from the gap data set uh, would be this um, uh, sentence you have at the bottom. So we've got a English pronoun her. Um, we're trying to uh, resolve that with respect to two potential reference, either Polly Simmons or Eliza Bryant. Uh, which of the two uh, is it? And the issue here is the observation that for um, naively trained co-reference resolution models, as they're called, uh, they tend to perform quite uh, a bit better for male pronouns than female pronouns, uh, you know, largely for uh, um, reasons relating to exposure bias in the, the training data. We train a lot of male pronoun data, a lot less female pronoun data. Anyway, so for today, I'll, I'll mainly, mainly be talking about source bias, uh, but I've kind of abstracted you away from the data set, so uh, kind of blink and you miss it. So then, Again, just sort of uh, fairness 101, uh, nothing specific, specific to NLP here either. Um, the way that our methods uh, tend to uh, work is either based on pre-processing. So you look at some distributional properties of your training data, um, you, you do something like downsampling or upsampling or instance weighting uh, uh, based on static uh, properties of your training data. You feed that into your machine learning uh, algorithm and off you go. Okay, so pre-processing in the sense there's no um, explicit interaction in terms of updating any uh, um, particular um, hyperparameters as part of the training. It's all sort of done statically prior to the, the model training. Um, this is uh, what we call in-training, which is where the majority of the work is in NLP at least. Um, you're doing some dynamic process as part of your, your model updates. Um, so the example here is um, an adversarial uh, style approach where um, you're trying to reduce the, the representational bias that we were talking about before. We've got some hidden representation um, that our model is um, generating, uh, and we, we've got something like an adversarial discriminator, say, uh, applied to that, which we want to do as bad a job as possible, if we want our model to be fair, of recovering the predicted attributes. So using our binary gender example, things like male or female, say. Um, that's what we call in-training, and uh, lots and lots of different papers uh, in that space. Um, and then, again, a smaller number of uh, papers in the, the post-processing uh, space. So this is, I train my model, I get out uh, outputs of my model, or, or I, I use that static model, and I do some post-processing over that. So think of it as a pipeline. Um, so an example of this would be uh, iterative null space projection, for example. Right? I train up my model. Um, I then get the representations that my model uh, generates. I do uh, multiple iterations of projection of those uh, representations uh, onto the null space of whatever predicted attributes it is uh, I'm interested in. But there's never any uh, back propping to the original model. The, the model itself is, stays the same. Um, it's just I, I have this process that I do over the, the model after I've trained. OK, this will, uh, again, will come up a little bit later. So back to our, uh, the, the main uh, game here. Uh, so what is fairness? Uh, so there are lots of different uh, definitions of fairness, uh, particularly in the machine learning literature where a lot of this has come from. Um, broadly speaking, I guess there are sort of three main flavors uh, of fairness. Um, there's the, the sort of strict statistical independence between my model predictions Y and my predicted attribute Z, um, which of course has the downside that unless my uh, um, the data set is balanced, uh, um, I, to have a fully independent model, I may not be able to uh, produce, or I won't be able to uh, um, produce a 100% accurate model. You know, I, I, I can't normal my model in order to maintain this idea of, of a strict statistical independence. Um, so what people uh, tend to focus on instead is this idea of, of separation, um, where it's independence between my uh, predictions of my model and uh, the predicted attributes given the, the target label. Um, and an example of how this is manifested would be something like, well, 
I want the, the true positive rate across my different predicted attributes to be the same. So if we're talking about equal opportunity, which is particularly popular in, in OP. Um, and then we have sufficiency, it's the last one. We have independence between the, the gold standard label uh, and the predicted attribute given the model prediction. So this is <coughs> the idea that uh, if I partition my um, model outputs across different target labels, uh, they should be calibrated across the, the different classes. Okay, so the separation tends to be where most of the action is. <coughs> so coming back to the, the sort of aggregation question. So if we had a, a simple binary classification task with some binary predicted attributes, like uh, male versus female, um, then something like separation using equalized odds is simple. You know, we calculate the, the true positive rate for each of my predicted attributes, we can partition my uh, test instances or my dev instances, uh, and then calculate the absolute difference between those true positive rates. And if it's a purely a truly fair model, that should be zero. Okay, so I want that to be as low as possible. Okay, so good, but so this is when the, the big but comes in. What happens when I have a multi-class task? Particularly if I have a multi-class task in terms of both my target variable and my predicted attributes. Um, so this is an example of a um, the bios data sets the topographies um, if someone's writing a, a profile um, um, we remove any gendered pronouns and things like that we, we try to predict uh, what is the profession uh, and the predicted attributes here are again binary gender male versus female uh, but also um, socioeconomic status you know, are they from a, a wealthier country or a, a less wealthy country so I, I have in the full version of the data set sort of 70 ish different uh, professions and these two binary attributes for predicted uh, attributes, so four uh, times the cross product uh, of the two um, predicted attributes. So this is two actual models that we've trained. Um, so uh, you know, what we're trying to, to do when we uh, um, turn the handle with our evaluation metrics is say, okay, which is better out of model one model and model two, where lighter means better. And hopefully you can agree that if you look at those two heat maps, I don't know which of those two is better. It, it's really not clear. You know, how do you aggregate those individual numbers to say model one is better than model two or vice versa? Uh, so what do we do here? So of course people have hit up against this problem in the past. It's not a new problem, but you know, kind of everyone has invented their own uh, aggregation methodology. So it's just a sample uh, from the literature. So. You know, do you do the, the mean gap? Do you look at the variance uh, and uh, the, the mean variance? Uh, do you look at the maximum gap? Do you look at the minimum ratio? Uh, do you do it uh, just based on the groups, the protected attributes? Do you do it based on class? Um, uh, as, as the interaction between classes and these protected attributes. Um, so you have this mass proliferation of different ways of taking the equivalent of one of these heat maps and, and generating a single number um, based on these different aggregation methodologies. So what we sat down and tried to do is say, okay, can we introduce some order to the, the chaos that we see in the literature? Um, in the first instance by saying, okay, can we come up with a, a generalized form uh, for how we're doing the, the aggregation uh, in terms of our group-wise aggregation and our class-wise aggregation? And the answer to that is, well, yes, we can, which largely covers uh, those different um, variants um, by introducing P norms for the different levels of aggregation, the group-wise and the class-wise um, aggregations. Um, and yeah, kind of as a, a bit of an exercise uh, for ourselves, uh, as you went back to this real world example of model one and model two that we were talking about before and said, okay, so, um, yeah, let, let's kind of do the actual uh, experiment of if we adjust the, the respective P norms uh, associated with the, the group and the class aggregation, uh, which is better model one or model two, uh, where model two is blue, model one is red. The answer is, well, it depends on your P norms, uh, yeah, kind of as, as you would expect. So it's not just a hypothetical, it, it, you, know, you can basically sort of cook your results to sort of get the result you want by parameterizing your P norms. Uh, now, are you sort of likely to set a P norm of four or sort of something like that? Well, probably not. You know, there are sort of popular uh, values that you would have of you know, kind of negative infinity, uh, minus two, minus one, one, two, positive infinity, you know, in terms of 
mean versus max versus um, you can do sort of ge geometric mean or sort of something else. Um, but you, know, you, you get the idea that it, it's actually uh, uh, very important how you parameterize your aggregation methodology. So then, okay, what, what do we do here? Um, and it's actually worse than that because we've got the aggregation, we've also got the, the units, as in, do we base it on gaps? Do we base it on ratios between these uh, um, true positive rates, for example? Do we base it on the raw scores? Um, uh, so we, we then said, okay, so let's try to come up with a kind of a, a decision diagram to help out for a particular data set and uh, you know, what the um, kind of conceptual uh, um, idea behind fairness is with respect to this particular data set of doing the parameterization of how you should do the aggregation. Should you use a gap? Should you use a ratio? Should you use the raw score? Um, and should you be meaning or maxing or do the, um, you know, the arithmetic mean or geometric mean or whatever else? And so we've got a, a decision diagram for that. I'm not going to go through it in, in detail. I will refer you, refer you to the paper for details. Okay, so then the second part of this is to say, okay, so good, we, we now know how to do uh, aggregation for a particular model, but we don't just have a, one model. We have a, um, a, a range of models and a distribution of uh, whatever F scores versus fairness values that we, we're getting under these different aggregation methodologies with a, a given definition of fairness. Um, so, for example, on the left there, you've got this iterative null space project, uh, projection method that I mentioned before, <laughs> ASP, uh, where you can see as we increase the number of iterations, uh, as you'd expect, the performance goes down, uh, the fairness comes up. And so the, the, the question that we're trying to resolve here in terms of parameterizing uh, INLP is, like, how many iterations should I run? The, the, the key hyperparameter of INLP is the number of iterations that I do this null space projection. And uh, it's not clear, sort of based on the, the classic sort of fairness versus performance uh, uh, plots, how to do that. So yeah, what uh, people um, often do is present that as a, a Pareto frontier, as you have on the, the right hand side there, um, between different methods, um, uh, um, so that you've got a, a more comparable representation. But we still have the issue, though, of, OK, but yeah, if I'm trying to apply a different method, which of these models do I use? And out of you know methods uh, one, two, three, and four, say as we have here, which is better? So um, what we propose is, in terms of model selection, we have this notion of uh, DTA, so uh, um, the uh, distance to uh, optimum, where um, you can see up in the, the top right there, we've got a utopia point, which is uh, perfect fairness, we're, we're flipping our fairness, we one, one minus our fairness, and so one is a perfectly fair uh, method uh, and performance. Uh, it could go up to one, it turns out um, you, you can cap it based on, say, the performance for a vanilla model, uh, and you'll, you'll get the same results. We've proven that. Um, uh, and so, what we're doing is just the Euclidean distance from points along the Pareto frontier. Uh, where do we get the smallest distance to the optimum? Um, that's how we should do our, our model selection. So, okay, good. That gives me a single model if I want to actually do something in, in production terms. But I still have the issue of, but, you know, which method is better? So, yes, I could do my model selection and say, I'm the model selection, which method is better. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm building an assumption in doing this Euclidean distance of fairness and, and performance. I'm, I'm weighting equally under this sort of scaling into a, a zero one scale of zero to whatever. Uh, vanilla performance uh, uh, in, in sort of maximum uh, scale is. Um, but you know, perhaps in different scenarios, fairness is more important. Or, you know, I, I, I can parameterize those two. So, you know, particularly you know, if we look at the results of up the top end here, where kind of the action is uh, in terms of performance, um, uh, I, you know, I, we can see that the, the curves are crossing over. So, you know, which method really is better? Um, and at the bottom, uh, of that slide in terms of these four different methods. Um, doesn't really matter what the methods are. Um, INLB is this iterative null space prediction that you have in the, uh, the top left. Uh, we've got uh, different uh, ways, the DTO uh, on the far left, but different formulations people come up with for evaluation metrics, as you can see in the bolding, depending on which one of those selection criteria you use, 
again, pick your model. You know, any one of models one to four is the best model. Um, so what, what can we do here? Um, so the answer is, well, um, let's instead use uh, the area under curve, under this performance uh, fairness curve, um, uh, and, and use that. And it could be either over the full curve or over a, a partial curve within whatever 10% of the performance of our vanilla model all the way over on the, the right hand side there. Um, uh, and let's use that instead as an evaluation metric over the, the distribution of results defined by the Pareto frontier uh, so that we can then get a, a more definitive answer here, which actually uh, covers that, you know, the, that the, the full curve or part of the curve. So we, we then actually get a definitive answer here. So the, uh, our diverse adversarial method, it turns out, uh, does best on this. And then there's, there's sort of lots of details about how we do this sort of partial area under the curve, um, which I'll spare you and uh, refer you to the paper for that. So this is part one, uh, and I'll go faster for part two across. Um, so, uh, yeah, fairness, we, we, it's always going to be a trade off between performance and fairness. How do you define that? It's worse than that because we've got this issue of uh, aggregation, it's worse again than that because we've got the issue of just what is fairness and how do we define that? Um, and that then leads into these complications in terms of model uh, selection and you know, trying to sort of translate this sort of distribution of model performances onto this, uh, onto a, a sort of single fig figure of merit. So, so we've got proposals for how to deal with all of those. So it's slightly dry because there's lots of uh, evaluation metrics, but that, yeah, that, that's something that makes my personal heart sing at least. So then the second paper um, is iClear paper. So, you know, uh, along with the vast, vast majority of uh, work in fairness, um, you know, the strong assumption that we've made throughout our work is that we have full access to protected attributes for all of our training instances at training time, not at test time, but at the training time. Um, and you know, we, we're doing whatever with those predicted attributes uh, in this in training context, as I said before, uh, to try to sort of bleach out any disparities which uh, are attributable to our predicted attributes. But in real world scenarios, there's a, a very real chance that we don't have access uh, to those predicted attributes. Maybe that's for legal reasons. Um, in medical applications, in legal applications, there are many applications where you just are not allowed to get access to predict to predict those predicted attributes. Um, or maybe you know, it's just it's not available in that particular data sheet. Um, and we've done previous work where we've looked at uh, sort of partial labeling, so how little labeling of the training data in terms of predicted attributes. Uh, um, can you still achieve you know, reasonable fairness outcomes with um, and found that you know, the answer was uh, surprisingly little, you know, but at least it was 1% can actually sort of achieve reasonable fairness uh, results. Um, and under uh, domain uh, transfer, you get slight, slight improvement. So whatever predicted attributes from a, a paid speech detection data set, which I, I try to transfer across to a, um, a sentiment analysis data set, you do get some uh, um, boost in terms of fairness, but it's very, very slight. What if instead uh, we were to think about completely unsupervised with respect to our predicted attributes, uh, debiasing methods? And so the, the genesis for this was um, your classic TC plot here that we're all used to uh, reading the tea leaves of. Uh, so what, what we have on the, right, sorry, on the left hand side here uh, is a, a TC plot um, uh, for um, the uh, what is this? The Moji data set, so it's a sentiment analysis data set. Um, the colouring you have in so, uh, binary outcome, binary predicted attribute in this particular case, just to make it simpler to understand. Um, what you have in terms of the colouring is uh, blue is the protected attribute. Uh, sorry, um, the, the colouring of the dots is the predicted attribute. So, so blue is the majority, um, uh, this orangey colour is the minority uh, predicted attribute. The coloration you have in the, um, the circle around each of those training instances uh, is the loss associated with that particular instance. So the, the darker the colour, the, the higher the loss. Okay, and uh, so on the left hand side, this is all doing it in a a, a supervised way, the, the, the way that we, we're used to doing it. And you know, one thing which uh, sort of jumps out is two things, I guess, which jump out. Um, a, you, know, you get sort of some sort of locality effects in terms of, yes, 
be carry out in terms of uh, TCD predictions and over interpreting TCD predictions, but um, you know, the, the minority instances in terms of my predicted attribute, I'm, I'm definitely getting some neighborhoods, but kind of a, a lot of uh, um, uh, interspersal of the, the two as well. Um, but what jumped out even more is the fact that with my majority, my like minority instances, uh, I, I'm getting, uh, generally speaking, higher loss per instance. So again, this is sort of at some point in terms of doing my model training after a certain number of epochs, what is the, the loss um, by getting for each one of these instances? And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. That's you know, kind of the, the root uh, cause of where fairness or unfairness comes from. The fact that my model is very attuned to my majority class instances, that's my predicted attribute, and you know, kind of ignoring my minority class. So hence it, it's biased towards my majority class um, as a, an exposure bias uh, effect. What if, though, uh, we could use this you know, kind of not particularly profound insight, uh, when you think about it, as a way of generating proxy labels uh, to do debiasing relative to. So on the right-hand side here, what we have instead is we have, we have no access to predicted attributes now. The only thing we have access to is the loss with respect to the target label, as of course, not the predicted label, for each of the instances. And you know, we do a, a simple binary partitioning of our training instances based on the loss. So is the loss greater than the average loss per instance, or is it less than or equal to the average loss per instance? So the red is the less than or equal to, the green is greater than. And what we see is you know, a, a, a fairly close resemblance so, you know, with a, a static t uh, projection. Uh, between what we have on the right and the left. So you know, it's a very simple method in terms of uh, just is it greater than average loss, for instance, um, I can to a reasonable degree uh, um, reproduce my predicted attributes for, for this very particular predicted attribute we have for this data set. So having done that, if I then do this labeling uh, it's based on the, the red and green that I'm doing, reminding ourselves that no access to the predicted attributes, we're just looking at the per instance loss there. Um, now I can just plug it into any in training debiasing method, and off I go. It's just, it's not an actual label, it's a proxy label. Okay, so then that's so okay. I, I can then speed up, uh, up and uh, kind of jump to the uh, important details. So uh, just providing ourselves so we can get better fit for. Call it M uh, um, instances, which are overrepresented the majority uh, of particular attribute instances, and less well for the minority instances in terms of empirical fairness. Uh, I'm translating this back into representational fairness uh, in terms of uh, uh, doing a prediction um, and you know, looking at, well, I don't actually have to do the prediction, looking for neighborhoods uh, with respect to my representations. And doing some label smoothing for my proxy labels using a, a nearest neighbor in it. So rather than just doing it uh, as a as one nearest neighbor, just using the, the raw output, instead I'll, I'll use some uh, neighborhood, you know, K nearest neighbors around a particular instance, I'll smooth the, the labels across them in terms of generating my proxy labels. Um, and then uh, jump forward to the results. Uh, um, so just to walk you through the results, this is for one of the five data sets in the, the paper, um, but it's largely representative of the more complex tasks at least. The, the baseline is just a vanilla model, um, where I'm doing no debiasing. Um, I then have two, uh, so one uh, unsupervised baseline in the gray, um, and the senior supervised baseline, we've got access to 50% of my protected attributes. So it's, it's not a, a fair comparison with our method because I'm actually using protected attributes, just at lower volume. Then we have our method uh, paired with different devices. So the, the details aren't super important here. Um, it's basically um, a paper from uh, our group from last year with the yellow bars, and you notice that they're paired up in terms of color. Yellow bars are, we're doing uh, um, balancing up the loss with respect to the protected action. So scaling of the loss, sort of boost the loss for the, the minority protected attribute. The blue version of it, it's slightly more complex uh, in that we do 
uh, scaling with respect to uh, direct attribute and class. Uh, and then the green is an adversarial method. And so the uh, this sort of patch version is just using the proxy labels. The, um, uh, the normal version is when we use the actual predicted attributes. So, of course, we sort of get a bit of a drop. Um, but we actually find that we're doing better than the semi supervised method. In some instances, the disparity with the fully supervised method is, is very small. Um, so, it's surprisingly competitive and being compared to a bunch of uh, sort of standard supervised baselines like a fair match on the, the far right there. So I've, I've skipped over a lot of the, the details, but hopefully you've got sort of a, an intuition. We generate these proxy labels based on uh, data locality and just the, the per instance loss, uh, and then uh, pair it with a, a supervised debiasing method to sort of surprising effect. Um, uh, and uh, just by, by way of mention, we have a, this thing called Fairly. It's a great library. Use it. Uh, um, and coming back to what I was saying before about model selection. Um, if you do systematic evaluation under a, a model selection budget of existing methods from the literature, what you find is actually a lot of the sort of methods, methods are actually a lot better. The delta in terms of how much better you do when you do proper model selection relative to the original paper, the answer is quite a bit better. So use fairly because you'll get fairer comparisons of fairness methods um, and it will make your life easier. So just to summarize, uh, so fairness uh, is important. Uh, there's lots more work to be done. Uh, um, it's complicated because it's more objective optimization, of course, um, and there are other dimensions of uh, complexity that I'd be happy to talk about. Um, and yes, we can do uh, things even without access to unpredicted attributes. And with that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Safe talk about the fairness in LP, and we have learned a lot. So, due to we have a very tight schedule, maybe one very quick question. Oh, okay. Uh, so, do you think uh, in LP function di uh, dialogue system can provide a very good way to encourage the kind of dynamic fairness because of the interactions? So, maybe there's a way to design a good system. Uh, as in. The interlocutor is the, the system is trying to convince the interlocutor to yeah, be fair. Uh, or so because not? you know, if you just directly enforce fairness right in, uh, in a static way, so eventually the according to the effect, it's not right. necessarily fair. So maybe you can yeah. try to you know, you try to design a mechanism so that the system <laughs> can try to um, convince or try to change the users to yeah. be fair in the long run. Interesting. So, uh, I, I guess you're sort of getting into HCI territory in terms of persuasive technologies and whatnot. Uh, and possibly a simpler version of that would be you know, in an IR context, information retrieval over a session, say, um, how. So, if people in IR talk about fairness in terms of I don't want to have over representation of one side over another, say, um, uh, if I'm doing sort of interactively, I'm sort of looking at the result set and I'm uh, reformulating the theory to get different results in that. Uh, what's the interaction between the, the fairness with respect to the previous results and how I'm doing the, the uh, formulation? Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting question. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm really not aware of any work which sort of looks at it in that dynamic. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. So, because you have a lot of international experiences, including Japan, have you ever observed any difference in the countries or culture in terms of fairness? Yeah, uh, definitely. And you know, I guess we're sort of getting to more uh, philosophical territory. Uh, but honestly, one of the things that I am uh, particularly excited about with the unsupervised method is we don't sort of have to um, project our own assumptions about predicted attributes. Um, even in Australia, say, predicted attributes that people uh, would have thought about 30 years ago versus what they think about now are, are quite different. Um, you know, gender is a big thing now, where 30 years ago, it was a, a, at least a, a, a more two-dimensional thing, to put it that way, um, of you know, sexuality, sort of things like this, it's a very important thing. Um, if we're doing things in an unsupervised way, we're not sort of having to impose any uh, assumptions about, well, you know, what are the dimensions of predicted attributes that I should care about? Um, I can do it in a purely data-driven way using the, the characteristics of the data. And I mean, one thing we've looked at elsewhere is um, 
how much transfer you get between predicted attributes. Uh, so you know, if I optimize for a particular, particular predicted attribute, will it be fairer for other predicted attributes? The answer is it really depends to some degree, but it's certainly not perfect. And then you, know, you look at things like some gerrymandering, intersectional fairness, you know, sort of the cross of it was a Cartesian product of different combinations of uh, predicted attributes over a much larger set and get much fairer models that way. Uh, but it still presupposes that I, I know, I've got complete knowledge of what all the predicted attributes should be. Here, we don't have that. You don't have to make those sorts of assumptions. It's implicit in the data. Um, so in a way, it, it sort of skirts around these uh, um, sort of prejudgments about what the predicted attributes of interest should be or need to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, now, maybe please allow me to introduce you the second. <laughs> So I need to disappear to a, a meeting okay. which is very bad form. Okay, so our second speaker is from uh, Rican NLP. Uh, the speaker is Dr. Chibin Zhang. Uh, Chibin is on now, so please allow me to introduce Chibin. Uh, Chibin is now a team leader in Rican NLP for the team of uh, Tensor Learning. So Chibin uh, got the uh, PhD degree in computer science from Shanghai Jiao Tong University in 2009. So upon graduation, he joined the RECAN. So it has been many years. So now let's welcome Chibin's talk is uh, efficient machine learning for tensor networks. Okay, Chibin, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, thank you for introduction, but I, I'm not able to share my screen now. Okay, so the I, uh, it's, it's okay now. Uh, yes. Okay, it works well. Okay. So, so hello everyone. So my voice is okay, right? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you for introduction. So uh, today I'm going to talk about efficient machine learning with tensor network. So this uh, this is some uh, our team's work in the past few years. So as we know that now the machine learning is quite successful, especially in particular recent large language model achieved a remarkable success. But it always needs very uh, th uh, three important factors. One is we we always need very high quality big data set for training or the pre training. And the model size increase very dramatically with uh, each iteration or each generation of model and each year. In the end, we also need a lot of computation resources to train uh, to train our model. So I think the next challenge is how to to develop new machine learning model that we just need not much data set for training or our data is not very. Uh, uh, how, uh, how to say it's not very high quality. Maybe sometimes data is missing or data is like uh, data is uh, attacked by the attacker. And second is we hope to the model is also uh, become more efficient. Like we use a very small model to achieve similar uh, performance as the large model. And in the end is computational efficiency is also uh, another challenge. So today we will focus on the how to do the efficient modeling for deep, uh, deep neural network. As we know that <clears throat> deep neural network with over parameterization is a very successful technique. It has been uh, demonstrated very successful to achieve uh, high performance without overfitting. But such a complex architecture with a large number of parameters will generate some uh, drawbacks. Like we, we need a lot of computation to train the parameters. Also, the, for the inference, it's uh, quite, quite slow for inference speed. And at the same time, the model, such model is usually considered as a black box. It's difficult to understand how it happens in the inside and difficult to interpret the model. And, and also the model is like robustness to adversary, adversary attack. And it's very sensitive to the input 
even with small perturbation, which uh, dramatic change the output to be wrong. So one question is how can we dramatically increase model capacity, but without significant increase in the model size? So before I introduce uh, uh, our work, so first I would like to introduce very briefly what's the tensor network. And the tensor network is a very simple extension of matrix factorization for the two or two two dimensional matrix. And uh, later the tensor factorization is especially developed for the three order tensor. But when the order become much larger than three, it's uh, the model we call the tensor network. So actually it's just extension of matrix factorization to high order case. But in the high order case, there are many, uh, uh, a lot of flexibility and uh, uh, a lot of different properties. So by definition, it's a, a tensor network is a representation of n order tensor as a contraction of n small uh, uh, tensors. It was also widely applied in the quantum physics to describe the many body system. So as we know in the unsupervised learning, a matrix decomposition is a very um, good method for uh, discovery the latent structure or the dimension reduction. And uh, it's when we extend to the tensor network, actually uh, such technique can uh, help us to explore more the 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 structure internal structure of data or some dimension reduction for large scale data. So one particular example is tensor ring decomposition. Here is a, a, a very simple case given an order tensor X. So we try to represent an order tensor using a, a tensor network with many core tensors, and each core tensor is quite small size. And so the internal connection means contraction operation between the tensors. To further understand the, uh, uh, the, uh, the mathematic uh, competition, so each element actually can be represented by a product of a sequential matrix. And each matrix is extracted from each core tensor according to the index, mode, mode I index. And later there is a trace operation to ensure we have a scalar output. So by using tensor network, our, our goal is, our expectation is to capture more well the uh, data structure like tensor structure or multilinear structure or some low dimensional ability with uh, data structure. So next, we will talk about parameter efficient modeling by tensor networks. So uh, the goal is uh, one task in model uh, deep neural network is model compression. That means we our goal is to make lightweight model, which is fast and memory efficient and uh, an energy efficient. So intuitively, we have a lot of weight parameters and we try to reduce the number of weight parameters. And assumption is the parameters are some kind of redundant. We try to remove some uh, redundant information, but at the same time, keeping the comparable performance. So we can do this dinner training, like at the beginning, uh, you can assume the weight parameters is some kind of structure, uh, like low rank tensor structure. And then you learn the low rank factors directly. Or another way is after training, you have a very well-trained model. Then after this, we try to use uh, uh, some method to uh, approximate the weight parameters by using less number of parameters. We ex expect our method will be comparable with current algorithm. So like as we, uh, SGD uh, optimization algorithm. At the same time, we also expect to achieve computational efficiency by using uh, model compression. So uh, one typical way to using the tensor network to do the model compression is shown as a, uh, the figure. This is a very simple case example. We have a fully connected layer and uh, we assume our weight parameter W is very large. We try to compress uh, the weight parameter W. 
So we can do as uh, the following procedure. The first step, we tensorize W from the matrix to a high order tensor, like 2D, uh, 2D order tensor. After this, we approximate such tensor using a tensor network. This tensor network is, uh, is a, a particular case, it's a tensor trim matrix. So from this uh, approach, we can reduce number of parameters from MN to the this root MN. But at the same time, there is a uh, number R square, which control uh, the number of parameters, which is uh, considered as rank R. So if the W has a very good tensor network structure, the R will be quite smaller, then we achieve very good compression rate. Otherwise, we, we may not gain a lot of advantages. So next, in order to improve computational efficiency, we try to keep the tensor network structure in the training and the inference. Then what we do is we, we need to further tensorize the uh, input layer or the pre, uh, previous layer output to be a, a high order tensor. Then the all operation can be performed by using the tensor network operation uh, uh, technique to perform the, uh, such kind of multiplication efficiently. So to further understand how this tensor network can be uh, effective for the model compression, we use a simple case like high order latent factor analysis to study and investigate this problem. So if the vector Y, we tensorize Y as a high order tensor, then using the standard trick to marginalize eta latent factor, we, we, uh, we obtain the Y is the Gaussian distribution with the covariance matrix V becomes a high order covariance tensors. Then after that, we, uh, we do the tensor decomposition or tensor network decomposition of such covariance tensors we can finally obtain a tensor network representation of weight parameters W. So that means when we impose the tensor network structure on the W, actually we give the implicit assumption of the tensor structure on the data or latent factors, eta and y. So, but in reality, in most cases, our input data is not always satisfied the tensor structure. So here we show one, one work is, uh, is quantum inspired idea that we try to mapping the input data to a tensor network structure manually. So the idea is we project each pixel to a two dimensional vector, which is nonlinear mapping. Then after that, we using the, uh, we, we use tensor product to generate a tensor network representation of input. So which is a tensor network structure and actually it's a rank one tensor is very low rank. But at the same time, the uh, number of features are increased uh, exponentially. So finally, we see that combine this input layer with tensor network for weight parameters, we can achieve comparable performance on the batch, uh, standard benchmark and just using one layer. To further enhance the model capacity, we try to extend this idea to more general case like multi-view or multi-model learning. We have different representations from uh, different view or different models. Then we first concatenate the representation to be a long vector. After this, we using the tensor product for the such vector with itself for P times. So such tensor fusion give us uh, more expressive needs by using the high order uh, fusion uh, technique. Then after that, because our layer will be further transform, uh, transformed to the next output of the layer. So we assume all parameters will be represented by a tensor network structure. So which will allow us to not increase the number of parameters exponentially, but only linearly. So finally, we can achieve uh, po uh, polynomial enhanced model capacity, but only with linearly increasing number of parameters. So we show this technique can be applied to multi-model learning and, um, uh, uh, and uh, some 
some other models with a better performance and without the increasing of number of parameters. So when we apply this uh, tensor network for the RN, we see that we can also similarly to change the RN layer from standard transformation layer to the tensor case. So it's a similar uh, idea that, but here we concatenate the input and the hidden state as a long representation. Then we do the tensor product uh, with itself for P times, we get a uh, P order ten, uh, tensor network. Please note this is a nonlinear mapping. And after this, the parameters G will be a high order tensor. So by, by using such uh, convert, uh, converts, Actually, we don't need nonlinear activation function anymore because nonlinearity is already generated by the tensor fusion layer. And then later we show that when we use a P larger, it will generate a long memory. It's a one of the drawbacks of a standard RN. And if the P is small, we we give us a short memory. So next, uh, in order to um, uh, give a more flexibility, we try to uh, make a different assumption on the G because it's a high order tensor. So especially uh, in a special case, we assume G is just a symmetric CP decomposition. That means G is a sum of a rank one tensor. Then we can further convert such formula to be like this. So here we can see that actually our uh, our layer uh, our layer is changed to be like uh, similarly to a summation of many layers, and each layer with a nonlinear activation function is a polynomial function. So in the following in the following p is the hyperparameters, and we also develop some technique to learn the optimal p by using uh, another model to learn the P. For CNN case, of course, there are also many studies using the tensor to compress the kernel tensors. Um, but here we show that we try to understand CNN from another perspective, which is we call the, uh, uh, which is called uh, water uh, convolutions. And we, we demonstrate the CN standard CN can be converted uh, as a, uh, as a water convolutions without very deep layer, only simply with have only one layer, and there are many subnets. Each subnet is an order convolution net. So here is an order conv uh, convolution neural network. Please note this is a kernel, it become a high order tensor. And here is a, is a polynomial function for the input, which is not just a uh, to n dimensional convolution, but n order, n order convolution. So after this, uh, we also derive that if we given a well-trained CN, we can directly compute the VC representation by using the parameters from CN, we can get the parameters of VC. Also, when the model is a black box, we can use the VC representation to to make model dist distillation or to train a approximate model or student model to approximate the CN. And then we found that such models are very effective for the uh, 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 for approximate model because if we learn a perturbation to attack VC model, such perturbation can, can be also successfully attacked the original CN. Another uh, good ad uh, advantage is, is our model is easy to analyze the sensitivity of function, like how a function changes given the perturbations. We, we realize that the sensitivity of function is related to the L1 norm and L2 norm with the power n, power n. So that means the high order will give us more sensitive and easily to be attacked. So in the past years, tensor network has been widely studied uh, combined with deep uh, neural network like fully connected layer or regression network or and the convolutional neural network. We summarize all of the re uh, research studies like this. They change the model uh, like, uh, as following. 
So first, the data will be a nonlinear mapping to another space by using some trick, like like tensor network or rank one tensor. After this, they do the linear transform uh, transformation by tensor network, and some many different tensor network was applied, like tensor chain or tensor ring or hierarchical targets. But the question is how we can choose the best uh, tensor network for our uh, current machine learning task at hand. So this is one question people uh, ignored in the past years. So we try to study how to choose tensor network when we apply tensor network in the machine learning model. For the, this is some kind of model selection problem. If we consider tensor network is a simple model, so in the past, we, we have many different studies like how to choose optimal rank, already many studies for different tensor decomposition and how to, uh, and the models usually choosing by the manually given the specific data and the specific task. But quite recently, we, we try to study <clears throat> to how to learn the mo model, like which tensor network structure uh, should be used. And at the same time, we also need to learn the uh, optimal rank to fit our machine learning task. There's an additional de uh, dimension with, uh, which is a permutation, which is a unique property for the tensor networks. So let me uh, uh, introduce how, uh, basically how, why we need to learn tensor network structure and how we learn tensor network structure. So one example shows that given uh, some data set, actually the standard tensor network are not always optimal. Maybe in some cases, such arbitrary tensor network or topology will be the optimal uh, uh, model to approximate our data or capture the data structure. So, can we learn the optimal tensor network structure from the data? And this problem actually is quite difficult because even giving a uh, nine order tensor, there are 68 billion candidates and such uh, optimization is not usually continuous optimization. So next we formulate this learning problem to, uh, to do, uh, first we formulate the tensor network learning as a graph uh, representation. Here is the V is the connect, uh, collection of all core tensors. And we encode the tensor network structure into a, a adjacency matrix. So that means yeah, the number of row means the each node and the column is also each node. The connection, the number means the rank. If the zero means there is no connection. So this is uh, encoding of ten tensor network structure. And next, our goal is because we try to use much smaller uh, numbers or smaller model to represent the data or parameters. So our goal is to minimize the number of parameters or in other words, is to maximize the comparison rate. So this is our uh, optimization goal. So finally, we developed several algorithms to learn it because this is a discrete optimization problem. We use the evolutional algorithm. And uh, this example shows the permutation is also very important because even given the same topology or tensor network structure and the same rank, the permutation is actually significantly change the result, like the performance. Here, one, two, three are three different permutations. That means the order of core tensors are different with the fixed rank and the topology, but the number of parameters are uh, uh, essentially different. So next, we, we also need to learn the permutation. The permutation task is to search a good mode of a text mapping that how to map the different modes like mode one to different node, the mapping mapping and the rank. So in summary, there are many problems we need to solve like tensor network, uh, the rank, if given the topology and the permutation, the order of core tensors 
and the uh, topology, uh, like a uh, structure, like ring structure or twin structure or tree structure or anything else, maybe some arbitrary structure. So, yeah. Finally, I would look, uh, I would like to also share some related uh, research related to the computational efficiency. So you know, the matrix uh, matrix multiplication is a very basic mathematic uh, tool. So if we can increase the matrix multiplication even very slightly, we it will generate a lot of impact in the research world. So the, this work is developed by DeepMind last year. So they try to find the fast algorithm for the matrix multiplication, like standard matrix uh, algorithm need an eight times multiplication, but the fast algorithm, which human uh, uh, knows is seven. But when the matrix become larger, there is unknown uh, fast algorithm from the human knowledge. Then they, uh, they hope to use AI tools to automatically find uh, the fast algorithm. Then they found that tensor uh, decomposition is very useful to develop such algorithm. Firstly, we, they encode the standard algorithm into a tensor structure or tensor representation of the algorithm. After this, our, uh, the tensor decomposition will automatically generate the result which is corresponding to the fast algorithm. Like if the rank CP decomposition rank is seven, then the best, the number of multiplication we need is only seven. So finally, they apply this to the larger matrix. They achieve a good performance, like some of them are better than human known the knowledge. But the problem is the result is not global OT optimal. Even uh, some mathematician found that 96 is not the optimal for uh, five by five cases. So another potential in direction to increase the uh, competition efficiency is quantum computing and the quantum machine learning. So this is also quite related to the tensor network because each input is a qubit and it's some kind of like two, two dimensional vectors and this is tensor network structure. And a quantum circuit is also easy to convert to tensor network. And this is a quantum machine learning model. The currently the disadvantage is the qubit is quite limited due to the hardware, which can uh, only uh, process the small scale data and the model. And the performance on the standard machine learning task is still far away from the, uh, uh, I think the classical machine learning field. So in the future, we may also consider uh, if tensor network will be useful to further develop a better quantum machine uh, neural network model. So finally, a uh, summary, the tensor network is a very powerful tool for like extract features from a high dimensional structure data or to represent uh, parameters in deep learning. But there are many problems need to solve how to choose tensor networks, structures, rank, and the topology. Also, how is the robustness to adversary attack when we use tensor network and how the interpretability. And finally, the quantum machine learning is one of a potential direction we, we would like to investigate in the future. Uh, I, I would like also thank my team members and the collaborators. Uh, thank you very much. This is uh, the end of my talk. Thank you, Chibin. Thank you. Do we have questions for yes? <clears throat> okay, uh, thank you for your talk. So, uh, I, I used to work with this topic, so I have some questions. So uh, first of all, you mentioned like uh, <clears throat> you have done some work in searching the structure of the tensor ne uh, network, but I, I also used to like want, want to find the optimal uh, like tensor rank, uh, TT rank for the uh, for the uh, tensor network uh, because I I think there are some maybe connection between like tensor network with uh, quantum physics. Because, like to say, the TD rank here could be like treated as uh, have some maybe have some connection with uh, like uh, quantum entropy or something uh, or some like uh, physical measurement. So, uh, what 
do you think about it? And uh, could could it have some like uh, relationship with some uh, existing theories in machine learning, like in information world? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. It's a very uh, good comments and questions. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, learning rank and the learning topology is uh, emotional learning field is some kind of model selection, like a neural network, we need to search the architecture. It's a quite difficult problem. Uh, you mentioned the, the quantum physics. Yes, that's true. The tensor network concept actually uh, originally started from quantum physics. In, but I think in quantum physics, they have uh, uh, interest is different. They they usually uh, not interested much in, like how to choose optimal rank or structure. They are much interested in how to do the contraction efficiently because in the quantum physics world they try to model the very huge space, so they cannot do the contraction efficiently. So most inter interesting in physics is to find the best way to do the contraction, like. Uh, the order of uh, computation or contraction. So this is a, a, the, some kind of when we uh, when I talk uh, with quantum people, they are interested in. But for us, we are more interested in how tensor network is useful for machine learning fields. So I think in machine learning, uh, the learning the best rank because the rank control how good your model compression performance. And the rank also controls the model uh, capacity and the computational uh, efficiency and the compression rate. So I think in machine learning field, the model uh, rank and the topology is more important. I, I'm not sure if I answer your question, if you have any more questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Yeah. Okay, any thank you. Questions? Any more questions? I have a, yes. uh, a quick question. Uh, I'm wondering if the tensor neural network can keep the uh, property like a permutation environment or the similarity like in natural language processing like to keep this uh, property. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it can keep in general case. I'm, I'm not uh, very sure about every uh, detail about permutation or, or but I think in general it will keep because the the whole structure is still neural network so we try to only to represent the parameters using less parameters so yeah I think it doesn't change the main property of a neural network thank you okay any Okay, uh, so thank you, Jibin, and we move to the next talk. Oh, thank you. So our next speaker is uh, uh, Yu Wen Song. He's, he's from the, Yu Wen Song is from the Tokyo University. He's also affiliated with Rikun AIP. Uh, Yu Wen is a uh, research staff for the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. And his research interest lies in the uh, this decentralized and uh, modular neural, neural network learning. Today, his talk is meta learning in decentralized uh, neural networks. Welcome. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So I'm uh, Yue. Today, I will talk about uh, the meta learning in decentralized neural networks through the lens of uh, global workspace theory. So I have been obsessed with uh, working on the deep learning and uh, we have seen the deep learning uh, is constantly changing our world both in industry and uh, scientific discovery. And uh, we will see it continue to act as a technical innovator for the foreseeable future. Uh, however, one of the questions uh, I have been asking is the limitation of deep neural networks in the out of distribution generalization so uh, we typically try neural networks using data uh, from a uh, prepared uh, single distribution data set. Then we um, apply the model to our uh, same data from the same distribution. 
Uh, however, the real world is usually not like this. Often with the uncertainty in diverse data distribution, uh, which leads to the undesired uh, model performance uh, on the unseen data. So the challenge here is to develop uh, neural networks with uh, improved generalization abilities beyond the trend distribution. So to achieve this goal, uh, we are considering collecting the uh, real world data, uh, usually intractable. So instead we take an approach that uh, consider the meta learning scenarios where we aim to tackle new tasks by selecting and combining the knowledge learned by different uh, individual neural network uh, models. And there are many different benefits, but the two main benefits we are considering is uh, uh, firstly, it will allow the agent to track the common, stable, and reusable information. Uh, which can be reused by the other agents uh, uh, in the systems. Uh, another critical aspect is uh, we want to ensure the privacy when we imply some large foundation models uh, without uh, uh, compromising the different client's data. Uh, so we can protect the user's data at the same time to do the knowledge transfer between different models. So this study of meta learning in the decentralized neural network setting uh, is inspired by the uh, global workspace theory, originally proposed by Bass in 1980s. So this theory referred to a theater of mind uh, in which uh, there's a con conscious contents that resemble a bright uh, spot on the stage uh, of the memory. And we want to select uh, uh, a few modules at a certain point uh, to be enter the working space. Uh, so we aim to solve the problems uh, through the cooperation and uh, uh, the computations among different uh, neural network models uh, in such a, a shared space. And the one aspect of this theory is its ability to perform uh, two different uh, actions. One is we wanted to perform uh, very fast and uh, precise, um, more like the hub tractions uh, through many specialized processors. And at the same time, we also wanted to perform a controlled uh, processing um, using the global workspace by selecting and reusing this learned specialized processors. Daniel Kahneman also described the same concept uh, in his uh, uh, idea of system one and system two AI. So system one type of processing is usually intuitive and fast, though often uh, difficult to explain. So it's more like today's uh, um, monolithic uh, deep neural networks. Uh, by contrast, system two is usually explicit and slow for tasks like uh, logic reasoning and planning. Uh, there are several directions like a majority of neural networks uh, using meta learning to learn a uh, learning policy. And uh, there are also research on neural uh, symbolic AI to build a knowledge graph of different components. So in this study, we want to explore the idea of majority in the deep neural networks. So in the context of this direction, there are many recent works on building a collection of neural network modules to tackle the unseen task. Uh, decomposing a neural network models into modules uh, has been shown to um, lead to improved generalization, uh, transfer learning, and uh, better uh, performance on the whole task. Well, it also enables um, certain interpretability since we, are, we can understand now uh, which experts uh, contributed to the uh, to what, what to extent to the final decision. So in this talk, I will uh, presenting uh, three, uh, three different approaches to improving the neural network generalization through the knowledge transfer in a shared global workspace. I will discuss uh, how replica neural networks, uh, hierarchical neural networks, uh, and the multi-model neural networks and um, how they can extract reusable information from their pure uh, network uh, modules. 
So first, let's look into a uh, key short comments, uh, uh, which is uh, the neural network usually show good in distribution performance, but struggle in the out of distribution settings, such as the dis distribution shift problem. And this problem become more um, critical when we consider the decentralized modular neural networks with uh, lots of different modules depending on their uh, own independent data. Um, first, let's consider a training data sets. We call it a DS and a test data set DT. And we assume they share the same support of the input and the output space. Then their inputs uh, have domain discrepancy with basic styles, uh, maybe due to the factors like the different data collection environments uh, they are in. For instance, in the simple digital image classification task, uh, some data domains uh, may have uh, complex backgrounds with uh, lots of uh, uh, irrelevant information. And the task here is uh, we try to uh, tackle a test uh, task based on the information from the training set given to the model. So the knowledge can be transferred uh, more efficiently. Uh, so this framework shows uh, how a decentralized uh, setting of the knowledge transfer problem there are multiple agents. They usually try and separate models uh, using samples with the different styles due to their data uh, collection environments. Then they'll go here to solve a, a given node task uh, by leveraging the reusable information from different uh, lended representations and the lended model parameters. As we can see directly, using the lended representations from different tasks is uh, usually challenging due to different uh, distractions uh, and the discrepancy in the local training data. Uh, here I show a multi-source uh, domain adaptation method that is aimed to uh, disentangle the invariant uh, stationary features from different uh, local tasks so that we can improve the performance. And it composed uh, composed of uh, three different uh, components. So it's a picture disentangler, embedded matching, and uh, federated voting. Uh, so let's look into how these components will contribute to the final performance improvement. Um, first, the global picture disentangler. We try to learn the to distinguish between the representations of a uh, source domain and the target domain. Uh, and we try to encourage the feature attractor to uh, distill the feature that are domain relevant uh, among different clients uh, by maximizing the loose uh, of the disentangler. On the other hand, we also want to make sure the lended, uh, lended features uh, are common and stable uh, across different clients. Uh, so that we try to align the attracted representation at the same time uh, using the maximum mean discrepancy loose. So, um, so this constraint will also encourage the stable learning of the common features. And the final component is we use the uh, federated voting, um, a strategy for model fine tuning. Uh, in particular, when there are no labels available in the given task, the federated voting can generate the pseudo labels for the unlabeled task based on the voting results of different uh, lended uh, local models. Uh, so that the new model can be lended, uh, uh, can be trended uh, with uh, better information from the novel task. Uh, so in this study, we performed evaluation on both image classification and uh, the text sentiment classification task. For each data set, we use the one domain as a target task and the trend model based on the remaining domains to tackle the selected uh, target task. So how much benefit can actually be derived from the noise transfer between different models? Uh, we we propose the group effect metric, and uh, this graph shows the measurements of this metric. As we can see initially, the, the group effect values, or oh, in certain uh, case, we can consider it's a, a transfer loose. It, it's a very high at the initialized states. 
that means uh, when we start the collaboration between different models, um, the, there is a few shared uh, common knowledge can be transferred among different clients. So the efficiency was not very good, but uh, as a learning progress, we can see uh, the common knowledge between the uh, different models increased uh, um, gradually. So the effects of knowledge transfer uh, improved as well. Um, so by comparing with the baseline method, we can say that uh, the decrease in the transfer loss it usually will stop at a certain convergence point. Uh, however, by using our method, we can see a later convergence of uh, such uh, uh, behavior so that uh, mm, more knowledge can be transferred among different uh, models. So these two graphs show the, uh, the proposed method outperforms the other methods for the transfer learning uh, across the different tasks. And uh, generally, uh, where there's about a 4% uh, increase of 2.3% increase, depending on the data set. OK, great. Uh, so let's move, to, move on to the next topic, which is uh, I want to talk about the class shift problem and how we can uh, design a collaborative system to tackle uh, this uh, uh, specific problem. To consider the class shift problem, we tackle the model training on the known ID data, uh, where each module was trained using data with a specific uh, class distribution. So for a class task evolving C class, this, uh, it's assumed that uh, each module has each, its own data set, uh, but there are some certain constraints we give to the uh, data generation. So we, for, uh, for each uh, local data set, there is uh, one main data class that uh, contains the largest amount of data. Um, and each cluster in this graph on the left-hand side, it uh, represents the multiple modules that share the similar data class distributions. And uh, we can consider there's the star symbol it represents the state of the initialized uh, collaborative system. Uh, and as we mentioned, it uh, consists of this, all these uh, different uh, modules in the, uh, in, in the working space. Then the learning direction of the system uh, will depend on the selected modules at each time step. So uh, based on the learning policy, it may move to the orange uh, cluster or it move to the uh, red cluster. So our goal is to find out uh, in uh, which order, in which sequential uh, decision-making um, options we can obtain the best model performance by reusing these different modules. And so we tackle the skirt classification a uh, class distribution as a markup decision process. Uh, so there are multiple neural network modules uh, organized in a form of uh, ASIC graph, each with a specific uh, class distribution. And uh, for each time step, we will take action, and the action will change the state of the system through the parameter sharing, which results in a reward based on the uh, new model's performance. And the objective here is to uh, say we want to maximize the cumulative reward after uh, one episode uh, learning or one trial of the uh, systems learning. So how to do that uh, is uh, uh, based on the idea from the reinforcement learning. So we can consider the uh, deep Q learning uh, to learn such a learning policy to learn how the knowledge can be transferred among different models. Since there is no prior knowledge of each module's class distribution, uh, so the algorithm has to predict uh, an action based on the observed states distribution of different modules at each time step. Uh, so it will make an uh, action and to decide which module it will transfer the knowledge to so that the overall performance of the uh, obtained model can be improved. Like this, by using a inner loop module update, uh, 
to learn the basic uh, defenders basic models and uh, outer loop policy update based on the reinforcement learning. Uh, we can accelerate the, the overall model learning process. And which can be uh, which can be proved uh, shown in this graph. So comparing the convergence time of using a random module selection policy, leveraging an outer loop policy learning to learn an optimized noise transfer policy among the modules can uh, significantly reduce the time cost by around 50%. And the graph on the right hand side, it just illustrates uh, the increasing absolute rewards. So that shows that uh, we can uh, we can do use uh, 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 reinforcement learning to learn how to um, how to combine the different knowledge uh, distributed among different uh, models. So the last uh, part I want to talk about uh, is uh, when we extend the single model case to the cross model case, can we still um, obtain the same effect as we expected. Uh, so the null transfer problems uh, uh, is uh, it can be extended to multimodality. And one example is uh, the visual question answering task. In the visual question answering task, it aims to produce a correct answer um, based on a pair of uh, image and the question. Uh, so we want to use the, the same modular noise transfer idea for the multi-model setting so that the different users can choose their personal models and uh, we provide the noise transfer among these models to improve the overall performance of the uh, aggregated uh, model's performance. In this regard, the conventional approaches uh, to the multi-model learning are usually monolithic, uh, monolithic using uh, single fusion models. Uh, uh, it's different from the experimental settings. Uh, training a VQA model in real world uh, is usually challenging regarding the large scale the data collection. Uh, we, we cannot expect uh, a model usually be trended with uh, uh, we are prepared the data set. Uh, so in real world case, there are many distributed data from the user to be collected. In such case, the multiple agents that represent the different perspectives of the Intel data distributions, uh, we want them to collaborate with each other to solve a common task. And it might improve the generality of the model to the unseen situations. Um, so the transferring and the aggregating the knowledge uh, from these different models uh, is uh, crucial to uh, achieve this goal. Uh, in this sense, so we try to devise a framework uh, to allow different uh, clients to collaborate with each other in the multi-modality scenarios. I try to overcome the limitation by using the self-supervised learning to try a global model that uh, aims to learn the refined uh, representation through the model sharing between the different uh, parts of the system. And as we also mentioned in the start of the presentation, the privacy is also uh, important in the design of such a system. So it's also, it can also ensure the privacy um, uh, in such systems by using a split uh, architecture uh, which will separate a complete model into different parts. So basically the claim parts and the server parts will collaboratively train a model without uh, exposing any information about the data the model is trained on. And we found that the supervised learning um, is very useful in, in such uh, privacy preserving case uh, to be combined with the split uh, learning, uh, which allows noise transfer with uh, different uh, clients uh, more efficient. Uh, so, um, so due to the time constraints, uh, I may refer to, uh, I may recommend the audience to refer to the papers for more details of the architectures. Um, 
And so this uh, list I show the effectiveness of the method uh, by utilizing by state of the art uh, three models. And we can see uh, if we use the contrastive learning based VQA without any labels prepared, we can still achieve a, a good performance uh, for different tasks. Uh, but uh, if we want to build upon such uh, architecture with the uh, uh, additional privacy guarantee, um, the framework, the proposed framework can provide the competitive results without uh, greater sacrifice in the model performance. So it will be useful in the situation that uh, we have different separated data sets, but we don't want to uh, let the clients or user to share their data set in order to train uh, large foundation models. Uh, we simply want to train separate models and uh, allow the model to share information uh, through model sharing or representation sharing. Okay, so finally some takeaways. Uh, the ability of the neural networks uh, uh, to generate to out of distribution data uh, is uh, currently um, uh, um, we studied the limitation and the performing the noise sharing and the social learning among the neural network models. Uh, we uh, think this approach can benefit uh, the performance uh, in the non uh, in the out of distribution settings. Uh, for example, we can use the in interconnected models with similar architectures to build uh, the hierarchical structures or using. Um, inner loop basic learning and outer loop learning for uh, learning policy optimization. Um, and in addition, we also can we also can consider how to use the supervised uh, method to do the knowledge transfer between different uh, modality representations without uh, compromising the privacy issues. Um, so finally, we argue that um, the meta learning inside a shared global workspace consisting of different uh, models. Uh, uh, it can enable the collaborative learning uh, from different uh, specific uh, neural network modules so that we can transfer knowledge uh, more efficiently. Um, so hopefully we will learn how to build a robust and generalized for machines in the future. So by knowledge transfer in a global workspace, uh, without needing so much data to tackle the uncertainty in the real world. Okay, great. Um, so that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you for your uh, listening. Thank you, Yuan. So due to time limit, we may have uh, only have a very quick question. Do you have? Uh, then I have a very quick one. So for your first uh, session, the uh, current shift session, you mentioned that uh, you have uh, generated some stool label by using federated voting. And afterwards, during the experiment, you have observed the uh, phenomenon of late convergence. So normally, if the generated labels are not reliable, if there's a late convergence, there could be some kind of overfitting problem. Have you observed this in your experience? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. So uh, it's a good point for the uh, federated setting. So, so the federated voting, the reason we propose this method is to tackle the problem of uh, unlabeled uh, uh, data training and so if we consider there are many local models, the local models are all well trended. So if we can do a voting, it can generate some labels to for the fine tuning. Um, and for this graph, the late convergence here is uh, a, a slightly different from the uh, this function we're generally seeing in the machine learning uh, studies. So we define the group effect uh, matrix um it's uh, um so for the metric the lower the better it shows uh, how much information can be gained uh, uh, from the transfer learning uh so as you can see the orange line here is the method without 
uh, using the federated voting strategy. Uh, that means there, there is no fine tuning on the uh, targeted data set. Uh, and uh, for the method we proposed, it used the federated voting, uh, so it can contribute to a late convergence. Uh, so it can overcome the problems of overfitting, as you mentioned um, in the question. Thank yeah. you. Thank, Thank you. you again for the nice talk. Then we have the coffee break. We have some nice drink and uh, cakes. Please enjoy uh, online. Uh, sorry for the online audience. <laughs> we only have the drinks and the cakes for the outside audience. Thank you, everyone. Yes, I'll go back to make sure it's clear. Um, so that I have to take it. Yes. Look, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, yeah, great. So, are you ready to present? Oh, okay. okay. Good, good. So, then, so, welcome back to the second session. So, the first speaker is Professor Lee Song. So, I think we know each other for know, more than 15 yeah. years when you were in Tubingen. He's one of the yeah. experts in kernel methods, you know, graphical models, and deep learning, and also bioinformatics. So I don't have the title of this talk today, but he will be talking about great research today. So, okay, please start. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Masashi, for the introduction. Yeah, uh, it's a really nice event. Yeah, we can put researcher from Recons and then MBGI together. <laughs> Let me share my slides. You can see my slides, right? No. You, you can see my slides? Not yet. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for no, coming. No, 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 not yet. We cannot see the slides. Only your face appears. Connection is bad, actually. <laughs> Yes. Uh, Can you hear us? Now, can you try to share the uh, slides again? Oh, yeah, yeah. Ah, come you are muted. <coughs> All right. Hopefully everything is okay. Okay. Uh, thanks everyone uh, for coming. Um, I would like to share with uh, uh, people about some of my recent work. Uh, recently, I have been, you know, uh, engaging deeply in the areas of uh, AI for drug design, right? So today, I'm going to talk about a family of uh, large pre-chained model for multiple data, and using that to, you know, address some of the uh, interesting kind of drug design problems in the industry, right? 
um, I'm working with this company, Biomap, as well. Yeah, uh, to drive these, uh, you know, uh, AI model and 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 uh, you know, use it as um, in some industry problem. Right. So let me just give you a little bit background, right? Uh, about the system we are dealing with, right? Essentially, in order to design drug, we are, we are dealing with this very complex, multi-scale uh, um, human body, right? Essentially, you can think about it, it is a multi-scale heterogeneous network. From the causes scale, you can see the human uh, has different organs and these organs are connected to each other. They need to collaborate and, uh, and in order to accomplish the normal function of a human, right? When something goes wrong, you know, uh, very often you, you can identify the particular organ which uh, has some problem. Of course, we can zoom further down all the way from the human body level to molecular level. Let me just explain a little bit more detail. For instance, if you look at this organ, a uh, particular organ, for instance, the stomach in this case, and look further into it, you will see that actually it has uh, many different types of cells and then these cells actually will communicate to each other and for a network as well. The cells are communicate with each other while you know small chemicals uh, and some of the cytokines and and uh, also uh, protein 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 interactions. Right, uh, these cells uh, interact uh, and form a network in order to accomplish the normal function of a particular organ. You can take a look at the individual cell and zoom further down one level. Right, then you can see that actually within individual cell there are many different type of molecules. It can be protein. It can be DNA and RNA. Uh, they interact with each other, regulate each other to, you know, accomplish the function and, and uh, of a particular cell, right? And uh, that's not uh, everything. Uh, you can zoom further down and look at individual molecule in this uh, single cell. And you will see that, that each molecule actually has very intricate structures. And it by itself is a network of uh, actants, right? For instance, you look at the protein, it's going to be a network of amino acid, amino acids, to be you know, folded, this sequence of amino acids is going to fold into 3D structure for a geometric graph uh, of uh, uh, you know, uh, actants. So it doesn't matter whether you look at the RNA or small molecules, you can always use some kind of graph to describe these type of the, you know, uh, mole molecules, it's a 3D graph. So uh, you know, when, when you try to identify something we call the target for treating the particular disease, you actually want to go all the way from, you know, the human level, organ level, all the way down to molecular level, right? To identify which, uh, you know, protein is the key cause of that particular disease. And even down to the level of each one, each one of these, which one of these uh, amino acids uh, is causing the problem, for instance, right? Um, uh, in some sense, uh, the target discovery for uh, uh, treating disease is a problem of identifying a critical node, important node in this multi-scale network, right? Once you identify critical node in this multi-scale network, then uh, that's typically a particular molecule with a 3D graph structure. Then you want to design the drug to treat it. The drug you design can be either small molecule or another protein, right? And, and this design drug has to, you know, um, um, be, you know, design a way that, the, for instance, uh, the, the, the particular actin or amino acid using this drug has to be right, such that uh, it can form something we call the lock and key kind of mechanism uh, to, to have a strong enough interaction between the, uh, the drug and the target. So uh, that's uh, uh, the high level overview of the drug design problem and, and then the target discovery problem, right? So you can first see that actually it's a very complex multi-scale system. And I've mentioned many different types of uh, uh, you know, ways of, to look at the disease and, and the potential type of data we can get. For instance, for the organ level, uh, we might get lots of the imaging data, right? Or maybe some of the behavior data of the entire human body. And uh, you can uh, go one level down. Nowadays, we have... Uh, uh, ways to measure the gene expression of particular cell, single cell, and seek. And uh, there's even uh, some new technology to measure the gene expression uh, uh, spatially as well, right? Uh, you go further down into a particular cell, and you can actually also uh, uh, measure the interaction between different proteins and protein DNA, protein RNA, for instance, right? And for 
So you can measure the protein sequences and even some of the 3D structure of the protein uh, using cryo EN kind of uh, uh, technologies. Um, for other other type of molecules as well, you can also measure its structure, right? So um, the amount of data is actually becoming huge. The amount of data is actually matching the scales of the internet data already. For instance, for protein sequences, uh, because we have uh, this sequencing kind of technology, the protein sequence data generated with a very high speed. For instance, uh, the protein sequence data can be billions of protein sequences already, right? Um, and each protein sequence, is, you can think about the amino acids uh, with uh, 20 different choices, that the typical length of protein is a few hundred amino acids. So the amount of tail token is hundreds of billions or even more, right? Um, and for single cell seq data, uh, because we are able to measure for individual cell the gene expression for, uh, for a particular cell, so nowadays, uh, this technology is also uh, developing very fast. Uh, we can easily get 50 million uh, single cell data from the internet, and you can curate them um, to, uh, in some sense, align them together to form a big data set. For instance, the number of genes in a particular cell uh, can be uh, 20K, right? Uh, and you have 50 million cells, then the amount of data is also huge billions of tokens, right? Um, and uh, so uh, there's, uh, need in some sense to be able to learn from this huge amount of data, right? And uh, unfortunately, most of this data unsupervised in nature, right? Uh, not tied to a particular, you know, disease you are most interested in, not tied to a particular, you know, uh, a target you, where you want to design a, a binder or drug, right? So it's like a huge amount of, uh, or internet scale uh, unsupervised data. You want to somehow learn some, uh, information for it, or you want to learn some representation for it, such that some of the downstream tasks, such as finding a particular uh, target for a particular disease, designing the protein drug for a particular target, which has a strong binding affinity, uh, can be uh, somehow uh, leveraging this type of a uh, big pre-chain model. So uh, over the past year or two, I've been working with this uh, company, Biomap, uh, first, to curate this a huge amount of internet scale data coming from computation biology. The two examples I already mentioned, uh, one is the, the billion uh, sequence uh, for proteins and uh, 50 million uh, single cell seq data. There are many other data, uh, such as a protein protein interaction as well, and dual regulation type of data. Right? So essentially, uh, uh, we want to somehow uh, see whether some of the very successful paradigm already in machine learning, uh, maybe in other areas, such as in uh, image, uh, in text, or in multimedia, uh, those successful machine learning paradigm or AI paradigm can be transferred to address some of the uh, very challenging problems in, in uh, drug design, right? So nowadays, without using uh, this data, uh, it would typically cost like 10 years and, and, and 1 billion US dollars to develop one job, right? And we want to see uh, if we have some smart AI models, can we accelerate the process of developing drug and significantly reducing the cost, right? So in order to do that, uh, you know, with these multi-scale ways of you know, human body and with that kind of uh, uh, unsupervised data. So we are exploring a paradigm, which is uh, essentially very similar to what's done in natural language processing, right? Uh, what we have witnessed uh, in the recent year are these uh, development of uh, unsupervised kind of model, you know, tra trans big transformer model like BERT and generative model, sequence generation model like uh, GPT, right? Um, it ingests a huge amount of unsupervised data, right? Uh, either learn to recover mask positions in a sentence or trying to generate uh, the second half of the sentence given the first half of the sentence. You use uh, this huge amount of data chain or pre-chain your, your language model, right? And once you finish chaining this language <laughs> model, then you use a small amount of downstream data to fine tune your model uh, to address some of the downstream problems, right? Um, since we already have, uh, in some sense, even a scale of biological data, uh, can we actually uh, apply this paradigm and, and get it working in some of the uh, downstream biological problem, uh, which is particularly relevant to uh, the uh, drug design kind of business, right? That's uh, what we are trying to do, right? So essentially, based on that kind of a challenge, we've seen multi-scale human body and this uh, AI paradigm, which is already very successful, 
the natural language processing kind of community, uh, we have designed a, a, a family of um, pre-chain models to support this kind of downstream uh, drug design task or some of the tasks which are essential to the drug design and target discovery, right? Let me just uh, uh, give you an overview of this uh, family of uh, uh, pre-chain model before I go into individual detail, right? So uh, this uh, family of transform model is called the uh, extremo, right? So it is the acronym for uh, the cross model transformer representation of interactome and multinomics, right? So it's actually not just a single transform model, but uh, it's a family, uh, nested family of uh, transformer models, right? So you can see that in the innermost is this extremo A for amino acid sequence. And the one level up is going to be extremo P for protein interaction, right? And then one level up is going to be extremo C for, for cell representation. And, and another level up is going to be extremo S for a cellular system or cell cell communications. So the input to this uh, extremo family are the, the, you know, the internet scale data I mentioned to you, right? Uh, billions of protein sequences and, uh, and tens of thousands of protein structures, uh, precise structures, and even more protein-protein interaction data and uh, uh, millions, uh, tens of millions of single and sick data and lots of perturbation as well. So for the innermost level uh, model, some of the typical kind of downstream tasks you want to handle is going to be uh, something like a protein structure prediction. You probably uh, are aware of AlphaFold 2, which has revolutionized the structure biology by you know, uh, providing a very accurate model for predicting the structure so of protein. Essentially, the model takes the protein sequences input and output the three-dimensional structure of the, the protein. So this three-dimensional structure of the protein uh, is uh, critical. You know, understanding the structure or leveraging the structure is critical for understanding disease and developing drugs. Uh, is is indeed the three-dimensional structure which determines the functions of the protein, right? And you also want to make prediction about the property of the the, the protein, right? And uh, protein rarely function in, you know, in isolation. So you always interact with other protein or other small molecule or other kind of actants to, to carry out its function. So it's very important to predict protein-protein interaction kind of property or uh, protein complex structure. When two proteins that get close to each other, how they, you know, interact or bind to each other, right? That's why in the protein interaction level, you are interested in complex structure prediction and uh, making prediction of the protein-protein protein interaction network. In the cellular level, then you will be interested in, for instance, uh, after representing the, uh, the cell, you want to make prediction about um, uh, what if I perturb this cell by, for instance, either knocking out some genes or, or by you know, uh, perturb some of the membrane proteins, how the gene expression level of that cell will change or how the function of the child can change. For instance, if that particular cell is a cancer cell, you want to uh, uh, intervene or perturb it such that it will die away, right? If it's an immune cell, which are good cells, and then uh, you want to perturb it such that it will be more active, right? To kill other cells, for instance, right? Similarly, you, you can think about when you, the cell also rarely function uh, in isolation. You always interact with other type of good cells and interact with other type of bad cells. Uh, in order to actually have a system level behavior. You want to make further prediction about what if I co-culture, uh, put two types of cells together and I put up one, one cell and how it affect the entire system. Yeah, I want to make that kind of prediction, right? Um, so I'm going to go a little bit more into detail into each individual block. You will see how this uh, paradigm are being in some sense, uh, uh, um, used again and again, essentially you use some of the pre-chained model in um, data from particular scale, and then uh, add another uh, downstream model uh, to address some of the downstream kind of task, right? Uh, first, uh, let me just uh, explain a little bit more detail about extremal A, the innermost layer for protein uh, kind of pre-chaining, sequence pre -chaining, and use that for downstream task. So essentially um, what is in the bottom are going to be these uh, uh, single protein sequence inputs, right? It is a sequence uh, where the, the token can take 20 possibilities and the average length is about a few hundred, right? And then you can have uh, this uh, uh, sequence-based transformer, 
uh, put on these protein sequences. And then uh, you can use the things such as mass language model uh, uh, or the uh, generated pre-chain transformer type of chaining to chain your, your sequence transformer, right? Once you have the sequence transformer, right? Uh, information or in the embedding, you can use it to further to build your uh, structure prediction kind of model. So essentially, you can have another uh, transformer which fuses this embedding from the sequence transformer, right? And then uh, some additional information about the potential homologous template structure. Yeah, some of the homologous uh, protein sequence already had the structure. You can leverage those existing uh, homologous protein structure and fuse the information with the uh, embedding page run from the sequence transformer. And, and once you have done the uh, information fusion using the transformer cross, you know, model transformer, then it can uh, uh, have a, a structure prediction model to output or regress over these uh, uh, the 3D coordinates of the protein structure. Of course, uh, you can also take these type of embedding and just predict the uh, the sequence level entire uh, property of the protein, such as uh, whether the protein itself is a stable or not, whether it can be easily expressed, how natural it is comparing to other protein sequences, right? Um, you can see that in the bottom, the protein sequence is billions of sequence, but the, 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 the protein which has a structure is only tens of thousands. So there's a huge scale differences in the amount of data for a you know, more uh, kind of a complex uh, downstream uh, kind of uh, uh, information comparing to unsupervised data. So uh, uh, the model is uh, uh, chained in two stage for the 10 billion uh, protein sequences we will use transformer and unsupervised the pre-chaining to obtain uh, uh, this type of the sequence representation. And on the top, this structure prediction we will use a small amount of you know, a determined structure to fine tune the model and achieve very good performance. I will show you some of the numerical results later on uh, for the, the prediction model and comparison to some of the other models such as alpha for two, right? Okay. So uh, this is the sort of the uh, uh, example when you're trying to use pre-trained language model for structure prediction. So uh, one interesting thing to mention is that uh, uh, for this sequence uh, transformer uh, we have in the bottom, now we have already chained a, a, a very big model, right? Uh, it's already a hundred billion kind of parameter model, right? It actually requires quite a lot of engineering effort to uh, scale up the chaining uh, of 100 billion parameter. Essentially we use the 800 GBU of three months to chain such a model. What we find is, you know, comparing to a model with 10 billion or 1 billion parameters, as we increase the number of parameters, it indeed, you know, uh, learn better representation for the input sequence. And, and when you use it as a downstream task, and it actually gives you better performance. Um, so uh, one level up, you can imagine that if we want to understand the interaction between two proteins, either predicting a complex structure between protein interaction or just predicting the binary label for whether they are interacting or not, uh, we need a, a, a different downstream model. Um, one thing we can leverage is, is this feature uh, representation we obtained for single protein sequences, right? So we already have innermost layer, which is extremal A for you know, representing the single protein sequences. Uh, we have, once we have the single protein sequences representation, we can uh, merge or integrate their information with some kind of cross protein transformer, right? before we actually input it into a, a complex structure prediction, right? Again, uh, you can see that, that this uh, more refined or, or complex kind of a, a label is very small. It's only uh, 10,000, right? Uh, complex structure data points, right? Um, we can use it uh, to, to find your complex structure prediction, right? So uh, with this type of the two-state chaining, you know, uh, essentially first pre-chain and then fine tune with additional kind of uh, data. So we're able to obtain the sound very fast and very accurate structure prediction type of model. For instance, here I'm gi giving you an uh, example for uh, antibody uh, structure uh, prediction, right? And in comparison to AlphaFold2 in this data set, AlphaFold2 is also pretty good. 
in predicting any body structure. Uh, it's uh, average RNSD room mean square error of the predicted structure compared to the ground truth is uh, around three, right? With this uh, pre-trained model and fine-tuning approach, uh, this extremal AB4 antibody 4 is able to produce an error, uh, you know, around two, right? It's a uh, 33% uh, improvements. In terms of uh, another metric, which is TN score, Allying, you know, describing the alignment between the predictive structure and ground truth structure, extreme OAV4 also has uh, significant improvements from somewhere uh, uh, from somewhere 85 to somewhere close to 90 percent, comparing alpha for two, right? Uh, by the way, alpha for two, in order to make prediction about a structure, it relies heavily on something called uh, multiple sequence alignment, right? Essentially, take a protein sequence and such a gigantic uh, protein database and find those uh, evolutionarily close protein as a feature. That process is very slow. And uh, uh, with this pre chain language model, which does the work uh, with the pre chaining and the inference time, uh, it can be very fast without querying this uh, huge protein database uh, uh, by sequence alignment. So you also achieve uh, a huge speed up. So that's why when you're comparing to uh, alpha fold two in terms of speed, you see uh, uh, hundreds of times faster, 150 times faster, right? Okay. Um, similarly, uh, you can use uh, this type of pre chain model with down fine, downstream finding tuning to build uh, uh, essentially the, the complex structure prediction. In this particular case, is the antibody docking to the uh, antigen, right? Okay, that's a very important first step for designing antibody to recognize, for instance, some of the uh, virus uh, kind of uh, protein, right? Okay. So uh, in this particular benchmark, we compare to uh, alpha photomultimer, which is specially designed for a, a protein complex prediction, and Equidoc, uh, which is a deep learning-based, another deep learning-based docking method developed by Tommy Yakolov on MIT. And HDoc is a fast and pretty accurate uh, uh, docking method from the classical kind of uh, uh, from CADD or physics kind of community, right? So extremal dot is able to improve the accuracy by quite a bit. Okay, so something uh, you know, uh, many other methods like uh, the average dot Q, the higher the better, is around uh, zero point one to zero point two to something uh, above zero point two. Okay, in terms of speed. Uh, because it's a deep learning based approach and it's actually quite fast. And uh, Equidoc is also deep learning based, it's the fastest, but uh, the performance is really not there yet compared to Alpha 42. So, in some senses, Alpha 42 Mortimer is the closest competitor, but we are much uh, faster and, and more accurate than, than Alpha 42 Mortimer. Right? That's some of the benefit we can get. For, uh, from pre-trained language model for you know addressing sound uh, protein structure and protein complex structure prediction problem. These two accurate prediction actually will form the basis for, for de novo or in silico kind of drug design. Because every time we design a protein, we want to understand what's the structure of the design protein and how it is interacting with the target protein precisely. So accurate fast uh, prediction will allow us to essentially screen or I'll go through the, the huge incident to find the uh, most uh, useful ones, right? So for instance, here are some examples comparing the prediction of uh, alpha for 2 multimer and this uh, extremal dock uh, in this uh, you know, COVID spike protein. And you will find that the extremal AB fold, the extremal dock is able to produce much better uh, kind of uh, structure. Um, so essentially in this figure, the gray uh, colored uh, structure is going to be the ground truth structure. And then uh, the on the left side, the purple colored structure are the prediction by AF2 uh, multimer. And on the right, the blue colored structure is the prediction by extremal doc, right? So the score, the higher the better, the doc here is for extremal doc 0.65, significantly better than, you know, the AF2 multimer, right? So with that kind of prediction, then you can optimize your, your design sequence such that it, it is in the right shape and uh, a docking into the right position, right? So uh, we actually used these uh, two models for uh, designing some antibodies for uh, uh, a target, which is commonly used in uh, cancer therapy at the moment. Uh, that's the PD-1 uh, kind of target. 
um, you can imagine that the, you can use uh, these two programs as the, the CIF, and you can generate uh, in silico millions of uh, antibody sequences and use these two, two programs to choose the ones that is promising and, and send it for wet lab synthesis, right? Um, so uh, with this uh, predictive approach, we're able to uh, optimize or find antibody sequences, which uh, has 10 times better binding affinity, right? Comparing to some of the seed sequences, right? Uh, that's something uh, interesting, exciting, right? Yeah. Of course, uh, other possibility offered by this predictive model is you can actually use a Bayesian optimization or some kind of reinforcement in trying to find the sequences which satisfy some property. For instance, uh, you have the antibody structure prediction, antibody uh, antigen structure prediction, maybe other kind of um, objectives such as by the affinity or expression level stability prediction. Then you can set on a multi-objective optimization problem, right? And trying to uh, have a policy of optimizing that kind of multi-objective uh, problem, right? And uh, for instance, uh, uh, one simple kind of example can be uh, you have a coding structure which is already given to you uh, in, in, say, green color, right? I want to design a new protein sequences, which also falls into the same structure, right? But with a completely different sequence. Then you can use this type of, uh, you know, either Bayesian optimization. Uh, actually, we are uh, the, the result I show here is just using evolutionary kind of optimization, right? To try to um, find some kind of uh, uh, local minima or local maximum of the objective function. And uh, you will find that actually you are able to find some sequences which are very different, which is in the blue, right, um, to the original sequence. But the structure is very close to the original structure you want to mimic. Right? Similarly, you can also design something like a binders, right? Given one protein, you want to define another protein which also binds to it in the same position. You can also use this evolutionary algorithm or other smart algorithm to optimize the, the antibody uh, sequences, which satisfy these multiple objectives, right? Uh, yeah, that, that's cool. Yeah, as we you know uh, make this uh, predictive algorithm more accurate and more efficient, essentially we will be able to do lots of uh, you know uh, potential design screaming and uh, you know uh, search in silico before sending it to uh, wet lab experiment synthesis uh, that can uh, hugely improve in some sense success rates of the uh, wet lab experiments, right? Um, I would like to also quickly mention about you know uh, the uh, the next two levels of models. One is the human cell, right? modeling uh, the uh, how cell response to perturbation. If we are able to make a prediction, accurate prediction about how cell response to perturbation, uh, essentially those uh, uh, perturbation, which you know uh, results in desired perturbation uh, will be the potential target for treatment, right? So in this case, uh, again, the model is going to change in a two level. So in the, in the, you know, the leftmost, uh, the gene encoder or gene expression encoder will actually change a larger amount of the single cell and sick data. But you can imagine in future, uh, there will, will be potentially, you know, gene expression data measured simultaneously with the sound the protein expression data and some of the epigenomics data as well uh, in multi-omics fashion simultaneous from the single cell. Then you can actually chain, pre-chain this type of the, um, uh, gene expression model or multi-omics data using huge amount of single cell observations. <laughs> uh, actually, after you change this uh, representation and you can build downstream perturbation model, essentially perturbation to a particular uh, protein is like uh, you apply a perturbation particular node and there's a gene regulator network, protein interaction network, the perturbation will propagate in the cell and affect the expression of other genes. Uh, you can use the pre-chain the gene embedding as the initial embedding of, for this node and with uh, some kind of additional learning for the perturbation, uh, then you will be able to make prediction about after perturbation, how uh, the gene expression has changed or how the entire function of the protein has changed, right? Um, uh, essentially, this is a high level kind of uh, uh, 
architecture so of these uh, deep learning model. Again, it's changed in two kind of uh, um, stages. First, you use uh, these uh, tens of millions or 50 million cells for pre-training, and then the, the perturbation is much smaller. Uh, typically, it's going to be a, uh, a few thousands or tens of thousands of particular type of cell. Then use those for pre-chain, uh, for fine downstream fine tuning to customize it for a particular type of cells and uh, and to uh, make prediction about the perturbation effects, right? Once you have, uh, you know, how a single cell are responding to perturbation, you can actually uh, connect uh, two of one of these single cell modules to build in some sense, um, perturbation model for a uh, cellular system or cell cell uh, interaction. Right? So in this particular case, the perturbation may actually in one of the cell, but because there are communication between cells while the membrane protein or cytokine release things like this, the effect can propagate and you know essentially affect the uh, function uh, or you know the behavior of cell or on the other other side. Okay, so with the deep learning you know, module for this cellular response to perturbation, it's very easy to tie them together to build some kind of predictive model for cellular interactions. Right, essentially the additional thing you need to link them together. Are uh, going to the expression level of for the memory protein from one side, and as the inputs to the uh, memory protein kind of uh, um, expression level to the other module. Right? Uh, with this, uh, actually, there are some additional technical kind of uh, details in order for uh, uh, for us to use transformer model on single cell and sick data. The challenge there is for each one is cell, there are around twenty k genes. Yeah. Like a long sentence with a 20k tokens, right? And you have a 50 millions of these uh, frequencies of cells here. So uh, actually, it's uh, not that easy to put a transformer on a long sentence 20k tokens, right? Um, so if you use the standard transformer or some of the approximated versions, such as a performer or Big Bird, somehow it's still hard to scale out to these data sets I just described, right? So, but uh, what we have done is we actually uh, uh, leverage a bit some of the special property of the gene expression data. So uh, in gene expression data, especially for single cell and seq data on the top left here, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you see blank spaces and, and, and zeros, right? So there's this kind of something called a dropout or uh, because uh, single cell and seq are, are actually measured with the genome sequencing, uh, with the sequencing approach, right? Some of the genes which are expressed in low quantity, they cannot, they will not be measured depending on the depth. Uh, right. So then actually you can use some idea from a sparse matrix representation and uh, compress this matrix and encode is the compressed version before you, you know, uh, build a, another decoder to recover the gene expression. Right. Okay, I will uh, probably quickly finish. Okay. Yeah. Right. So after we pre-train this model. Uh, 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 this particular architecture, first, we will have much smaller uh, parameter. Uh, it's like uh, given the same number amount of parameter, it can actually have much less computation compared to a standard transformer or, or performer. Right? And as we increase the model size, uh, its feed or its ability to recover gene expression is also increasing, and it can actually recover gene expression prediction with very uh, high accuracy. If we use this uh, representation of downstream kind of uh, perturbation prediction, it also leads to some state of the art uh, model for uh, this uh, perturbation analysis. So essentially you can imagine that uh, now we have this extremal family model, we can build actually a closed loop system, which connects the model prediction with actual white light validation um, to, uh, you know, to uh, sort of uh, optimize in closed loop some uh, protein sequences or drugs, right? And of course, there are a lot more to do. Yeah, we want to increase the speed of the uh, system, both in terms of the AI models and then the wet lab kind of uh, uh, system, and also improve the accuracy of the AI model such that uh, it, it can make better predictions and, and reduce the downstream failure. Hopefully by building a system like this closed loop uh, model and uh, wet lab system, we're able to quickly optimize some drugs for particular kind of targets. Maybe I would just stop here. Uh, uh, okay. okay, thank you very much.
Any questions? Uh, yes. So, yeah, so, okay, great, great talk. So uh, I'm wondering if you have uh, also integrated any this kind of dynamic data, for example, uh, this uh, kind of <coughs> expression observed from uh, this time lapse microscope, for example. Yeah, very good question. Um, unfortunately, we haven't incorporated uh, dynamic data. So, um, you know, actually, uh, in some sense, a more complete description of cell will be, you know, it has a temporal dimension as well. It's a dynamical system, right? It's actually a temporal dimension. And you also interact with other cells spatial, right? And uh, in order to get a, you know, better characterization of the cell and, and cell cell interaction, so in some sense, we need to do spatial transcriptomics and maybe simultaneous temporal kind of a uh, measurement as well. Uh, at the moment, uh, many of such a temporal measurements, spatial measurement is still in the, in some of the research, very academic, the lab kind of uh, setting. It's very hard to get large quantities to, to you know, uh, in industry setting yet, right? But it definitely that's the, the future of a better understanding cell and cell uh, evolution and to understand the perturbation and resistance of the cell, right? Things like this. Questions? I have one actually. So, because you, you, you are an expert of machine learning and biology at the same time, but for most of the biologists, this kind of talk is quite technical and difficult to understand. And so in Japan, some of the researchers in biology, including Rick and actually, are quite excited about ChatGPT. It can be an excellent interface for biologists to access machine learning techniques. So in your company or in your community, so how the ChatGPT is treated nowadays? Right, so um, I think that there are two things. Um, uh, ChatGPT can be uh, related or connected to uh, biology and or AI drug design, right? One thing is, of course, uh, just using ChatGPT as an interface, uh, you know, for assessing information, right? Maybe maybe assessing tools in machine learning such that it reduces people's, uh, you know, uh, in some sense, effort or, or, or even uh, calling those tools. Uh, that has nothing to do with uh, maybe analyzing biology data by itself. It's more of using ChatGPT as a, as an interface, right? Instead of you know clicking a button and go to find a menu and write some program, right? Yeah, okay. So ChatGPT can also generate program to call this tool uh, automatically, right? This is the first level, and uh, actually that's useful. We are building such an interface to help uh, or lower the bar for using the sound tools. The second level is more of the successful paradigm for G GPT, right? So it's really this uh, large scale pre-training plus fine tuning, right? Fine tuning with uh, some, uh, you know, extra domain or, or, you know, human good feedback, right? Uh, is very useful. And uh, I just mentioned that two cases in my talk, one is, uh, you know, this uh, big transform model chain on either protein sequences or, uh, you know, gene expression data, both are fundamental and, and in large quantity in the biological community now. And then use downstream, uh, you know, structured data or wet lab experimental data, or even some of the human knowledge to fine tune it to accomplish a certain task, right? So that's the second level, I think, uh, uh, it, it can actually uh, really make some of the predictive tasks very accurate in many biological problems and help them. Biology, you know, the advances, uh, things like this, right? Yeah. yeah thank you very much for the inspiring comments. There's a question oh, yes. from, uh, from Matthias Weissenbacher. Yeah. Um, yeah. Matthias, can you speak? Or are you the next oh, yes, speaker? Yes, I'm Can you hear me? Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah perfect. Hey. Thanks for a great talk. So I actually have like a, a quick question and maybe a little bit longer question. So the quick question is, if I understood correctly, like the, the 20K token length is obviously very hard for transformer. So you cut it down to like several thousand. So like GPT-4, like 8,000 or 4,000. So what is the rough order of magnitude of the token size of the graphics length? Yeah, so, so actually uh, once you, you know, use this bus representation, the typical token for a cell will be just a few thousand. Yeah, maybe 1,000, 2,000. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, you uh, and maybe the, 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 okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, yeah <laughs> just for curiosity. And uh, I find it exciting that you can say that you can make perturbations and then actually uh, scale up to the implications on a cellular level. So, like, how far do you think it's a way? So, to make a connection to the first question from having the spatial temporal settings where actually you can understand, like, kind of the software language of cells, right? Which is kind of seems to be in a, uprising field like the research of Michael Levin 
I think has mm -hmm. done some research, a lot of biologists have done some research on that, right? Which I find exciting, the empirical facts. Do you think how far are we away from modeling these kind of like software effects of cell networks mm -hmm. in, in right. years? So I think uh, the moment is still far, right? Yeah. So we can model the static, you know, status of the particular right, cell, right? right? The idea you want to have, uh, you know, a way of actually measuring the temperature trajectory of cell. At the moment, every time you measure a cell, you actually kill it. Uh, you cannot get real, you know, time series measurement of a particular cell in, right. you know, yeah. So of course, there, there are pseudo time other techniques for, for doing it, but it's really not measuring the same time. So if we have, a, you know, uh, um, I mean, before this type of uh, techniques become mature, right, generate large amount of data, it might be hard. So uh, this representation kind of approach is, is able to make some predictions. Uh, even there, uh, there's still quite a lot of room for improvements. I can imagine maybe in five years time, when we when we look back this problem with um, spatial technology, we will, we will be able to, I think, uh, do more in, impressive kind of predictions. That's okay, my, my kind of speculation, yeah. Thanks, very excited research. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Matthias, you are the next speaker. Are you ready? Yes, yes. <laughs> so the next next speaker is Matthias Weisenbach. So he's a researcher in Wigan. He's a theoretical physicist. And he joined Wigan and started working on reinforcement learning and geometric methods of machine learning. So today he will be talking about on generalization in reinforcement learning. Yeah, we can see the slide now. Can you see my slides? Yes. Not full screen. But... Uh, yeah, yeah, full screen. Yeah. Can you see the yes. slides? Yeah, Perfect. please go ahead. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the introduction. So uh, the talk today will be two parts. For the people who have seen the first part, I apologize. It will be largely the same. It's on uh, our recent paper, like I just call it from off NRL, data to symmetries and back as a short slogan. We basically, from we learn symmetries and generate out of distribution uh, samples, which then you know helps us to understand out of distribution generalization in the normal sense. In the second part of talk, I'm talking about ongoing unpublished research. So I'm gonna be very <laughs> superficial in some sense, but I hope to convey still some uh, interesting ideas on varying environment generalization in RL, which is a different type of generalization. So, right, so reinforcement learning very briefly, as you all probably know, is like the agent uh, receives an observation and a reward for an environment upon an action it takes, and that's basically a cyclic continues. So in online RL, like this is an active process, so the agent can explore the environment, where in offline RL, the definition is it's a static data set, which for example, you know, if you would have like a data set of self-driving cars, that would be an example of a common offline RL data set. And so in the first part of the talk, this was a paper published in ICML last year with uh, Yoshinobu Kawahari, Kawahara, uh, my PI here, and um, Sam and Animesh at the Vector Institute in Toronto. And so in often RL, as I mentioned, it's a static training data set, so no further exploration is possible, right? So what we do, we call, we use something called Koopman, uh, it's Koopman space, a learner Koopman representation and infer symmetries of the dynamics and then utilize the symmetries to extend that data set, right? So that's basically the one slide of what I'm gonna talk about in the next, I don't know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So let me, let me set the stage. So what is Koopman space? So Koopman space dates back to the early 20th century. It was developed uh, but Koopman and von Neumann, von Neumann also like famously known for his contribution to quantum mechanics. And it's basically an operator, a perspective of classical Hamiltonian mechanics, so classical physics, right? And, but it's similar, the language is similar to quantum mechanics. So, and in particular, the dynamic is linear, right? So what does it mean? So this is a very simple reinforcement learning environment called the mountain car. The car, the goal is to get up on, on top of the hill, but it doesn't have enough torques, enough energy to get up. So it has to learn to oscillate forth and back and, and gain some momentum. So, so here are some expert trajectories of an expert policy. And you can see that like, it's just a mountain car position, right? So it oscillates forth and back, and then it reaches the goal for all trajectories on the top right at a certain time. 
So, so there's a different initial condition, so plot, which I plot here. So there, this system can actually, the differential equations governing the system can actually be translated into Koopman space. So in the Koopman observables, so it's, I think it's like a five dimensional space. So I just like show here the projections and you can see in, in particular on the last slide, it's, it's, it's a basically perfect circle, right? So it actually is the time evolution, but a coupon operator just becomes a simple rotation in Koopman space, right? This is the linear, the linear action, right? So this is as a visualization and here the formal definition. So like I only have a few slides with formulas, so I'm gonna be uh, very brief on them. So, but just for, for, for um, completeness, I, I state them any, anyway. So if you have a dynamical system, the definition is basically, it's governed by a system of ordinary differential equations. So S here is a state space, but it's a vector, right? It could be like 10 dimensional, 100 dimensional, describing the system and the time derivative. And this is just like on the right side, you also F is a vector value function of the state and the action you take, right? So a lot of systems can be described by this the system of differential equations so is quite general. And then there's a theorem saying that any such system can be re represented by a set of so-called Koopman observables, which are called a G, which are functions on the, on the state and action space to the real numbers, such as literally just like this linear operator acting on G gives me like the same function G on the next state and action, right? So it's a time evolution in that sense. Right, so what we're gonna use in this paper is like not this general like setting, but like so a subclass, which is still very general of like, like differential equations can be represented by, so, by the so-called bilinear coupon representation, which means that the, the observable, so this is not one observable, right? This is in general an infinite dimensional vector space of functions, right? So it's a Banach space can be represented by this linear operator acting on chi, where this is just like a sum of, well, let's, let's say for our purposes it will be matrices, right? And chi will be finite dimensional. So right, chi will be finite dimensional vector of functions. And this will be just like matrices multiplied by the action i and the sum of it, right? And let me just mention, so there's also something called bilinear Markov decision processes in uh, reinforcement learning. And in fact, they can be expressed in terms of the Koopman operator, right? So there's a, there's a close re uh, relation to them. However, we won't touch this today because we will really be talking about dynamical systems mainly. Right, so what are symmetries? Uh, you have your beautiful examples of the rotation symmetry, right, discrete. So the, the sunflower can be rotated by discrete angles to roughly give the same shape and the mirror flip around the horizontal axis, right? So, this is a global symmetry. Global means like it, it translates the whole onion to itself, right? On a the horizontal flip. But locally, like the onion also has like some remnant symmetries, right? You can say that there's some local shift symmetry here, right? You can shift the onions by some discrete amount and we will get the same, the same roughly local picture, right? So we today kind of talking about local symmetries and in particular about like local leak groups. So, I'm going to skip this slide because it's very technical, but basically if you're familiar with group theory, like this is just the definition of a group uh, and local means it's a group locally. And also like the one new fact is that it has like this tail expansion around every point, right? So it can be expanded linearly around every point. So it's just the local groups. So, and what it does for us, what we're going to show is that, or what we showed in the paper is that if you have a trajectory in the system, so this is the state space, right? And let's say the agent moves along the trajectory at, at initial time ti to some different position x at the initial, final time tf. And this is the data you have in the data set, right? Then if you had a symmetry of the system, a local symmetry, what you could do is you could shift this trajectory locally. And you would get all of these new trajectories, which are not in the, in the original data set, right? And that, that is basically like a, a, a picture view of what, what we are doing in this paper. And let me show you quickly how we do it, a little bit more technical, but also uh, in, in well, schematic at the same time. So we just use a variational autoencoder, right? So take the, the state space uh, and we learn like the Koopman observables like this. So this is just a latent representation, a finite dimensional one. And, and, and it's learned in a way that like it is an autoencoder 
So the loss function is the sum of the autoencoder version, which just gives us ST. And if there's a linear operator, which is the, the bilinear one, which I showed you before, acting on the observables, it gives us the, the next state space. All right, the loss is a loss function, basically, is the sum of those two channels. And, and then what we show theoretically is that sigma uh, is a symmetry if and only if it commutes with, with K, with the Kuhlman operator. Right? Commute means sigma matrix multiplied K minus K matrix multiplied sigma equals zero. Right. So that's the, that's the mathematical definition. And that's how we uh, derive the symmetries after we've learned the Kuhlman representation. And then what we can do is, so we can take any data point here, ST and ST plus one, right? And is it is it again a, a high dimensional space? And you can imagine like there are different symmetry directions, right? Here it's just like three, for example, so sigma one, two, and three. And you can don't like, change the data as I showed you before of the original data point along any of the similar directions, right? And for like numerical stability, we just do it in a, like an epsilon ball region uh, around the original data point. And let me show you like, like so an example how it looks like. So this is like a trajectory on the top left from a D4 RL data set, which is a like benchmark offline RL data set. Um, and you can see it's, it's just running and there's a paper called S4RL, actually by our collaborators. And if you just, they just use um, random um, shifts of the state space and you can see how it looks like, right? It, it looks very, very chaotic. And that's basically what they use for training. And you can see on, on, a, on the top left that for, for two different magnitudes of our absolute region, basically, like that it still looks like something is running, right? So it, it's supposed to like look jumpy because we're actually like using different random variables for each time step, right? So it's not supposed to be a new smooth run. It's just supposed to be looking like that. Right? So that each basically time step looks like it could be in the original data set. And what we also show is that for this simple card pool, you know, like this couple environment, the card pool has to be balanced. We, we can actually learn in a self-supervised way the global translation symmetry. So we can see that the system has like this global translation symmetry, right? So it doesn't matter at which point of the exposition you are, your, the, the action the agent has to take is invariant in respect to that. Okay, all right. So, so like, what do we do? So we apply our technique as a precursor to the so-called CQLs, conservative Q-learning, a Kumer DAO. And we only modify the, the infamous Bellman error, right? Which is shown here. And so what this means is, like this formulation just means, uh, so we give it the probabilistic um, description, but there's only one um, probabilistic variable, a random variable, epsilon here, which is just we take um, normally distributed. And then we just take the encoder from before on the state. Then we shift it by the symmetry in the, in the epsilon ball region, then we decode it. So it's basically what I showed in the slide before. So this is the Kuhlman space embedding, the symmetry shift, and the inverse embedding. Right, actually, and I had this before, and a uh, randomly, normally distributed random variable. And we call this framework Kuhlman forward, if, forward conservative Q-learning, or KFC. So let's look at some empirical evaluation of this framework. So here are like four of the benchmark environments. So the so in the top left, the ant has to learn, as you know, it's running in a maze. So this is actually a robot, which has to be controlled, right? It's the ant with all the joints. And it has to learn like from a defined initial to a final position as to define its way. And then there's mutual code at different, you know, robotic environments like the walker and also like, you know, half cheater and like the humanoid. And there is like robotic control task where like robot arms has to learn to do specific things. And we also tested, I, I don't have a slide now because I didn't want to overload my talk with images of the so-called meta world and robust youth environments, which are all, which are both as well like robotic environments like this. So, and what we find is that our results of our algorithms KFC and KFC++, which are two technical variants, um, improve the state of the art by a, a non-significant margin. Um, when I, so what, what are the numbers? Uh, shown here. So this is the chum. So this is Mutuco. This is the Antmaze, Atroid, and Franca. And what we do here is we're, of course, perform every experiment five times. So different random seed as, as, as commonly done, but also like I average over all tasks. So each, the chum data set 
the chim block environment has probably like 15 data sets. So these numbers average the, 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 the rewards uh, average of all different tasks, right? All of the work has on the fork. So that's what this means. And you know, CQL has been improved by SRL, but it's surprising already actually by just random shifts, uh, random data augmentations. And like we again, like improved this. I mean, by about 10%. Okay. Right. So, and we also find this same performance benefit on the meta world and, and robust environment. Here you see like KFC plus plus in blue and KFC in green. And we like did actually in, in those environments now I give you explicit tasks. So this would be like the, the robot has to learn to push the door, uh, the door close, the reach the wall. And you, and you see like that it's also about like a 10% improvement on average. Right, so I, I usually ask for questions in the first part, but like probably have the questions in the end because I think the second part will be rather different. So let me just like give you a second to, to, to settle in. So in the second part, um, I'm gonna talk about a different kind of generalization. So in the first part, I just showed you on the left, we did out of distribution generalization, but there's also something called varying environment generalization, right? So where the agent has to deal with ch changes in the environment it, it deals with. And there's something else, which is uh, task generalization, which means the agent has to le learn to do a completely different task. However, um, I'm not going to talk about task generalization today and focus on, on the varying environment generalization only. So, so what does varying environment mean? For example, it could be that like the, the, uh, the ant you saw before, like there could be wind added or it could have different you know, legs, different sizes of legs. So you could alter the physical parameters or like a more standard benchmark for this would be the so-called Brockigan um, benchmark from OpenAI. And, and, and here the environment composition changes completely. So you could imagine like, like training it only on the, on the, on the first row. And then you, you see that you have different colors, different colors of opponents, so on and so forth. And there's a different generalization as well, uh, which is uh, even like it's sampled from a different distribution, if you wish, right? It's, not, it's more than out of distribution. It's the so-called destructed control suit from DeepMind or based on the DeepMind control suit. And, and you can see here that you have all these robotic control tasks and then there are random um, background videos added. So those are not st static images. Those are you know, high resolution videos. And also like the, the camera angle, the color of the, the robot and so on and so forth changes. And in fact, like there's something like a barrier, like so far the state of the art has not crossed this, right? It might be that it's here, I haven't checked maybe this in the last month or so, but like it's very around this area, right? So there's a long way to go, right? So that's what RL cannot do at the moment. So, so you can ask how you can achieve this. And that was something like, so generalization is, is still a very much open problem. And what people have done so far mainly is, in which actually works surprisingly well, is just to use uh, conventional data augmentation, which is very common in uh, supervised learning, um, as you can see here. And, and that actually, gives great results. However, obviously it, it will depend, you know, you don't know which augmentation will work first. So you have like RAT is just like, uh, means randomly augmented data and it's based on this PPO algorithm. And you can see here for like different like augmentation, like color cheetah, cutout color, random convolutions and so on and so forth. You get completely different performance, you know, of the score over, over the training time steps. And so this is very, um, well, this is very restrictive and very, very like in, in a way, a very naive approach and people looking into different ways. And in our approach to this is like, so now let me talk about what we are doing. So it's internalization via inductive bias, right? So, um, so the idea is that like, if you have like a, a policy network, which has a an, an flexible inductive bias, meaning it can adjust its learned preferences and symmetries, uh, on, on the environment, it, it well, 
it ought to be that it has a better generalization than taking a normal convolution network or a vision transformer. And in fact, like the, this has been kind of initiated by uh, Haidal last year, where they started permutation invariant vision transformers. So each patch is like permutation invariant, and it actually has shown that this has great generalization capabilities, right, for changing the background. And, and here it's just like, so what they use, they use the standard attention mechanism of transformers, but they, they fix the Q values, right? So usually there will be weights, trainable weights here, but they are not, so they, those are fixed. And they, they show that this, uh, this uh, attention mechanism has uh, permutation invariance, right? Permutation invariance, again, of the patches of the image. And what I mean by patches, that's that. So that's here, as you can see, that's, that will be a patch, right? So and, and permutation invariance means uh, between these two images, like that the network could not distinguish, right? So this is an obvious shortcoming of this network, right? Although it's um, very, um, well, it has shown significant uh, improvements in terms of general, its generalization capabilities, there's an obvious shortcoming and that's supposed to be this slide. So this is the cave flyer uh, Brocken environment. So here the, the objective is that the, the, there's a small starship it has to reach the goal, it has to shoot down the, the, the opponents, right? But you can see if my network would be permutation variant, that I can easily get solutions or uh, permutations thereof where there are no solutions to the environment, right? So the agent could not even possibly, you know, uh, achieve the objective. So there's a shortcoming. So what we're looking into is to find a like a half ground, if you wish, between having something which is permutation invariant, has the generalization capabilities thereof, and not having these caveats of running into this, um, this dead ends. And, and we do this basic, uh, like one part of what we're doing is we'll be looking at um, uh, translations, mirroring and rotation symmetries of these patches. So the network in itself supervised way anyway, learns like, a, like a, sorry, let me go back. It learns a, a graph representations of the, the important regions it wants to, to look at and keeps only these symmetries. And like, let me give you some results here. So what, what we did is like, uh, so this is like a toy example, it's the mini grid world, right? So you can see like, just like what the agent red has to accomplish a goal and then get the accomplish a task. Like you find the key, open the door and then get to the green spot. And like, what is commonly used for generalization um, is like the lava crossing environment where the agent has to not fall into lava and die, but go through the, the, the channel and go, go to goal. So you could ask the question, right? So this is such a simple task. How well does my, my CNN agent, which behaves perf like trains perfectly, finds the solution perfectly here. And by the way, of course, like for different environments, see different initial conditions, the lava will be completely different, right? So this is just like one way the lava channel could be. So, so how does well as the agent work if I, if I just turn this around, right? If I say that instead of left up, right down, go from right up, left down, right? Or by the way, so it's just simple rotations. Or if I just like let it start at the same point, but just change the goal position to either the other corners or randomly. And it, it turns out that like, if you take a, the normal CNN or vision transformer, it like 0 0.96 is basically the perfect score, right? It, it basically gets zero on the other simple tasks, right? Which is quite surprising. So you, you, even for this simple change in generalization, like well, it, it completely fails. While our agent actually basically maintains the score, right? And what we hope to do now is to, to what we're running now, in fact, currently the experiments on, on uh, having our model work uh, like for the proc again and, and distracted deep mind control suits. And I hope I will be able to update you with the numbers shortly. Okay, so like that brings me to my my, my last part. I, I, I think it was probably quite fast going through my talk, probably have a lot of time left. So, so, so far we've talked about like out of distribution generalization, right? And like which we learned is coupon representation and symmetries. So the ongoing research, which is like this varying environment generalization, where we learn like it's basically symmetries of quality networks, right? Uh, for pixel-based reinforcement learning. And 
so again, I'm not going to talk about the dust generalization, which is some other research we're doing, but like, let me, let me mention something which we started looking into recently, which is there's a different type of generalization, which is commonly overlooked and like often people wouldn't call it that way, but it's called hyper, or I call it hyperparameter generalization, right? It, it's something you don't even have to worry about if you do supervised learning. Uh, but it, it is a big problem in, um, in, in reinforcement learning. And it's, oft, it's, it's very often not stressed that much. And let me show you that the, the, the biggest pitfalls of what current RL algorithms run into, right? So I, I will put them into three categories. So for, first of all, there's something people refer to as catastrophic forgetting, which means, so let us look, look at the purple line here. You can see that the agent almost reached a perfect score. And then within like, for, for some reason, completely forgets everything and has to, has to start from scratch. Although it has access to that, the whole learned experiences here, right? Which are already productive experiences. And that's what, what you, you find very often, right? And you see that like for, for different curves, the blue curve also has like two times catastrophic forgetting, catastrophic forgetting, as well as the orange line as well. Like it's basically, it's hidden here, but it's up there and you can see it goes down all the way up to nothing, right? So, so that's one issue. Then there's something like, which is seat dependence and seat here means uh, the environment seat. So this is for online RL, where I can initiate the environment in a certain seat. And then based on that, the experiences, the agent like explorers are like different for different seats. And you can see that the, the, for, for those kind of settings, it also leads to completely different performances. So that's why there's a common like, evaluation um, procedure for um, reinforcement learning algorithms to do you know, average of five random seats or more. So you have to redo all the experiments because of that well-known problem. And, and there's something again, like which probably all of the, this, the other two categories also fall into, but which is very, very significant here, which I call hyperparameter failure, right? Which is of course, like you change the hyperparameter a little bit and the agent fails to learn anything. Right. And that could be like you add one layer to the CNN. It could be you change uh, the training rate by a factor of 10. So all the things you don't have to worry like in, in vision, for example. Right. If you add like one convolution layer more to your convolution in your network, like you will still find a good performance on the image net, right? It will just vary a little bit. So it's like here is more like a zero and one. It's like almost a discrete jump, right? And uh, those problems are largely unaddressed. And I think actually, and Andrew Nang had a Twitter like at the beginning of this year, like as a new year resolution to solve this hyperparameter problem in RL, right? As one of the biggest challenges for, for reinforcement learning. So I don't have an answer for you today, but uh, there's something we have considered thinking about. And the last slide's a little bit technical, but bear with me, it's only two of them or three. Uh, so, Ah, so he, okay, so here the, I have like one more overview. So you have like these three categories, right, of the pitfalls. And as I mentioned, supervised learning does not exhibit these shortcomings, right? And a potential solution we are exploring is reinforcement learning via optimal control. And what, what is optimal control? So uh, control theory, so reinforcement learning is based on control theory. And the, the main equation there is the so-called Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation, right? And let me shortly, let me, it's, it's actually very simple if you, if, if you like equations, it's like you have this cost to go function, which basically means if you're a position X at time T, what is your, what is your cost, you know, your, to go, to reach the, to reach the goal position. And you want of the minimal cost, right? So it's the opposite of, of the reward, if, if you wish. And like, like, what people do is they, you know, for this kind of settings, they look at the dynamic given by the ordinary differential equation. Again, this is like a vector here. It's basically what you've seen before, like where I wrote S dot equals F S A and see it like the, the action is U. It's just like the, the common name in the literature. And here you have a random variable uh, Psi and the HJB equation. is just like the, the linear time derivative thereof. And then you have to, to minimize over F is the is the cost at each time step if you take the action u. 
B is here the dynamic, and then the, the space derivative of J. And the last term I'm not going to explain because it's basically related to this random variable, right? So if you don't want to have randomness in your system, if you don't see there's any random noise added to your, to your observations, then you can forget the last term, which is what I'm going to do in the next slides partially. So there are a well-known solution to this. So this is called optimal control. There are two of them. One is called the linear quadratic regularizer or LQR. And there's something most frequently, most often referred to as important sampling. And so for us, for our purposes, optimal control is equals to, I want to find an exact solution to this equation, right? So that's basically what reinforcement learning does. The, the reinforcement learning is just like an approximate way of solving this equation, right? In, in like the, the different algorithms, but that's the goal. And of course, you can't do this in general, else was reinforcement learning wouldn't be a problem at all. So what these two algorithms need, they need very special dynamics. So they need very special, this is my last slide. <laughs> so you, you need like a linear dynamic here. And like, so it has to be linear. So it's very simple what you saw in the, the Kubman uh, space before, and it has to be linear in the action too. And the, the cost to go function is also like, is quadratic. That's why it's called linear quadratic. Uh, it is quadratic in the, in the states and the actions. And in, in fact, you find solutions to both of them, which I'm not going to go into, but so they have exact solutions, right? So you can actually compute. If you have a system like that, you can actually compute the optimal control. So for each, for each uh, point is where you are, like in state space X, there's just a matrix F, which you can compute to give you the optimal control. And similarly, for the sampling method, you can see that it's just like J becomes a sample, or so S is something like the cost, so the exponential of all the trajectories. So it's basically like sampling over your data set. And the optimal action then just becomes like the, the, the spatial derivative of this J. And we find this exciting because obviously, let me leave you with a question. So this is very much a setting of, of the Kubman space, which I showed you in the first part of the talk. So where you can, in principle, have optimal control as an exact solution. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? So in the context of optimal, optimal control, so what's the dimensionality of the actual space in reality? Because you have R inverse, and this is not tractable if the dimension is large. So, so, sorry. So you, the question is, what is the, the the action space? The action space for the robot is like, for the walkers, for example, I think six dimensional. So it's basically for every joint you have like one one way of applying the torque. Ah, so, then, so you basically focus on the small dimensional problem. Yeah, yeah, right, right. But but even like, so the thing is, this doesn't have to be learned, right? So this is one equation you have to solve once. So even if it's like a hundred dimensional. It's not something you have to do iterate at every training step, right? You do not have to solve this equation at, at each at each training step. This is something as soon as you basically what you do is or what you can start doing. Online update of the parameters. <laughs> right, right. So yeah, all right. So what about you? Ah, okay, yeah, 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 right. Okay, you're right. So fair enough. So if you would do uh, on, online control, then you would have to update this every time step. We, we are currently looking at offline RL. We don't need to do that. So you just have to, to learn like these parameters. So sorry, you can see it like these parameters. So A, B, Q, R, N. And then you only have to, when you want to evaluate, you have to solve for this equation. But you're right. If you would want to do online update, then this might be a problem with dimensionality. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, then let's thank Matthias again. Okay. So then, so last speaker today is Martin Takak. So Martin is an associate professor at the MBZ here. And he was an associate professor at Lehigh University in the United States. He's an expert of designing analysis of algorithms for machine learning, applications of machine learning, optimization, and high performance computing. Those are all the important topics nowadays.
Matthias, can you stop your screen sharing? Yeah. Great. So, what did we talk about training machine learning models without hyperparameter? Okay. Thank you. Finally, it works. Uh, I think that everything. So actually, uh, this journal work with many of my students and collaborators and so on. Actually, yesterday, like last week, I made Robert Gavre and Nikolai Zoizu in New York City. Hopkins and so on, and many many of them actually my students here. Okay, so usually when I give this talk, I start with this machine learning. I know that our guys they know it. Then I started to Google basically the second institution. As I'm clear, they know all this machine learning, AI, and so on, so they can skip almost everything. Okay. Also, basically find out some very nice groups there which I would like to collaborate. For example, something strange is here. What? <laughs> what is this? Uh, hey, what? Who's here? Hey, Who's here? 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 algorithms, uh, non-convex, and so on, which also I, I do a lot in my team. And also basically there are different teams that are working on these molecular, uh, basically molecules and so on, designing, again, very related to my stuff. Also basically, usually there are multiple steps in machine learning, and basically this talk I started to focus on the training part, okay? So basically, usually what we have, based some data, we define some model, it's a linear model, deep neural network doesn't matter, and basically, we associate some loss function for every data point, okay? And then our goal is to minimize, or some try to find the best ways to minimize maybe some empirical loss or basically some error or expected local loss and so on. And usually the N is very large, and also the dimension of the problem is also very large. Basically, you can have like billions of parameters and so on to, to tune. And also quite often, the function F is non-convex. So what is the algorithm we are using to train these uh, neural networks? Usually HDD is one of the simplest state-of-the-art algorithms, okay? So basically how HDD works, so basically in this case, I got many functions, this small f I want to optimize. In HDD, what I do, I choose only one function at a time. So in case, choose this function i randomly. So let's say I will choose one data point. Afterwards, I compute the gradient for this one data point, then choose some step size, and then I will update my parameters W from WK to WK plus one. What is nice thing about the HGD is that it's more unbiased, okay? Because I'm choosing this I randomly, so basically on expectation, I'm just going in the direction of the full gradient, okay, which is which is perfect. But there's some issue because there's some kind of like noise or variance because I'm choosing something which is <coughs> unbiased doesn't mean it's the same stuff, right? And basically, how does it work for HGD? Like how fast it is working? Because I'll just try to assume the function f will be just in convex for simplicity and smooth. So in this case, we can sort of show that, you know, like after some small math and so on, that on expectation, the difference between the current point or the function value for current point and the optimal one will be somewhat decreased because this quantity here will be less than less than one. 
and usually more than zero, okay? So basically, this gap will be shrunk down by some, some constant less than one and plus some additional noise coming from the, from the fact that we are using some kind of HDD algorithm, which is some variance, okay? So basically, sigma will be variance. You can see two things. I want to make this decrease as big as possible, so I want to have this one close to zero. So I somehow I want to choose this eta as large as possible, right? Which is good because then this term will decrease a lot. On the other hand, choosing large step size, which is the eta, will make the impact of the of the variance too much, okay? And it shows one can sometimes to make some, some algebraic expressions to simplify and obtain this result here. But after k steps of this HD algorithm, the error will somehow go down by this quantity one minus c times uh, step size to power k and plus something like this. Okay. Again, if k is very large, I run HD for a very long time. Hopefully, this is, this is between zero to one, so this will disappear. So the whole part here will be gone. I will only end up with this part, okay? Even if I run HGD forever, it doesn't help me to find optimal solution, right? It doesn't help me. As I'll see what's what happens if I run to it, can I'll see here I was choosing step size 0 0.01, so quite large, which means I was going down very quickly because this is close to zero, okay? But then I'm trying to start here. Somehow obtain better, better, better neighborhood of the, of the, of the optimal solution. Maybe I will choose a step size smaller. Okay, you can see here I choose step size, which was let's say two times smaller. Of course, I was getting maybe slightly slope at the beginning, but then I will have better neighborhood of the optimal solution, right? Because basically this term here will be two times smaller. Okay, or basically I can decrease step size ten times. So basically in this case. You can see instead of getting stuck here, I will get to much closer neighborhood of the, of the optimal solution, right? But because I was choosing small step size, this means this was reduced, which means this will be closer to one, right? So therefore I will be much slower. Some of makes sense. On the other hand, what I can also do, I can say I can keep the same step size, but maybe don't choose only one function or two functions, maybe some choose B functions, right? So basically in this case, the variance will be somewhat reduced. You can see here that yes, it's much better because choosing a larger bed size helps me to get to better neighborhood of the optimal solution, right? It's not helping me. But of course, choosing much more functions is also, is also much more expensive. So therefore, in actually in talking about how many functions someone, someone used, it will be much slower. So basically what people sound thought about is, you know, maybe we should design some algorithms which will choose step size, which is large at the beginning, okay? So can someone really have this nice fast convergence. And maybe afterwards, when I'm close to optimal solution, basically I'm stuck here. I know I'm stuck, I don't do any progress. Let's maybe decrease the step size, right? Actually, that's something what we already do when training machine learning models, right? It's called I don't get scheduler, right? It is scheduler, basically what you do, you just run maybe five epochs, then decrease learning rate, run five epochs and so on, right? That's what we do. But in some sense, we don't do it automatically. We don't do it automatically. We need to tune these hyperparameters, right? No one tells you how much to decrease and when, okay? And also basically something else, what you can say, maybe if I manage to reduce this variance by different means, I can still use my large step size and have very good progress, okay? Also, basically, there's something else like in deep new networks, we understand the multiple layers, right? For example, in this case, I will just choose some small, you know, like Linet. I just initialize the network and basically I some compute the full minimage gradient. As you can see, I will have for different layers, different uh, sizes of the gradients. Maybe in this case, the elements are from 10 to minus one, 10 to minus three. For some of them, actually, it can also have to 10 to minus five, okay? Can someone see that we have very different sizes of the gradients, right? But for HGD, we just use the same step size, it just makes sense, right? Because clearly, when you have different sizes of gradients, maybe some that also some choose different step sizes, okay? So basically, there's also this idea number three that maybe we should use different step sizes for different features or different layers, okay? 
And basically, now we're going to speak about these other algorithms. Okay, so HGD we understand super simple. Just choose a random function, choose some step size. That's it. Okay. So basically, in Adam or other graph, basically, what this one said is that maybe let's want to compute this scale because can be used to scale every feature differently. Basically, we just accumulate the squares of the gradients. Right. So in some sense, this quantity will be always increasing. Right. So it's, therefore, the step size, which actually is this top of stuff here, will be in some sense, in some sense decreasing, okay? Always over, over the time, which is somewhat good because we understand step size will somewhat decrease, okay? And also we understand here that if I was having some small gradients for some features, then this will be relatively small, and therefore the step size will be somehow larger, right? When the gradients are very large, and also this will be very large, and therefore this will be very large, so therefore my step size will be much smaller for a given feature. So cool. But to really get the best performance, usually people somehow still tune some kind of alpha and beta to really make it work well in practice. So there are still like some hyperparameters we have to tune to make it work. Okay. But still, if you do it, it somehow works because we are decreasing the step size. Of course, we'll manage to some good solution. But still need to tune the parameters. The same for Adam is roughly the same idea. They, they just basically one small change. They also use momentum, not just gradient, but some kind of momentum. And also they use some similar scaling for the for the features. Okay. But still, to make Adam work, we have to tune the step size. And also basically, it's not really adaptive in some sense, even though it's you know people's finger it's adaptive. Still, you have to tune the step size here. You have to, you have to tune it. And also, usually, what you to also do is somehow start it large and then decrease and decrease over time. So basically, it's still not really adaptive. It's still like so much, so much time to be wasted in hyperparameter tuning and so on. Okay. Okay. So basically, you can think about maybe what I can do is something different. Okay. What if I choose some function fi randomly? And then I wanted to find out if this is my stochastic gradient, what is the best step size I can choose, right? Maybe this is just one dimension problem. I can make someone choose this optimal gamma and then maybe take the step with this optimal gamma, right? It turns out it doesn't work because we don't optimize function fi, but we want to minimize the function f, right? So this doesn't work. So this could say this, this uh, whole lines of research inspired by Boris Poliak, actually who unfortunately passed this uh, thing last month or this month. But basically, yeah, what does it work? Let's assume my model is large enough, okay? Let's assume that there exists W star <coughs> for which the whole function for this W star will be equal to zero, okay? So basically, in some sense of it, you can say, maybe I will modify my algorithm to something as follows. Given my current model parameters, I want to find out how to update it just a little bit, such that if I linearize my model, I want to make this one equal to zero, okay? This is the whole idea. Imagine this one. If I know there is some, some, some point, W star, where every function will be equal to zero, but that's in this one. If I have huge models, it should be fine. If there is some W star where every single function, of every single loss should be equal to zero, what if I want to say, I want to update my current iterate only a little bit, basically I want to make the smallest change of my parameters, such that if I make some current model of the function, I want this one to be equal to zero, okay? That's very simple. Turns out, it's nothing easy just to solve this one and obtain the optimal solution, which is here, okay? It's still the gradient step, but it's on step size, which is not really depending on this eta you have to tune, right? The whole step size you can compute in runtime only depends on the function value and the size of gradient. Super simple, okay? So because suddenly we have this idea how we can basically run this algorithm HGD without tuning any hyperparameters. Okay. So basically, in this case, you can see here is a stochastic polyac step size. 
all those different red, blue, and green line. This is just some safeguard that I will choose to choose the step size which was given here. It is larger than some gamma max, I will just choose gamma max. Okay. So basically in this case, in this case, basically, I don't know why it doesn't work. Because I mean, in this case, gamma max was one, five, or hundred, doesn't really much, matter much, it's roughly the same performance. On the other hand, as you different step sizes, you can see different performance, right? Which really means that, and now I understand, step scale. Hmm. Okay. So as you can understand that if you really want to run Adam or SGD, you have to tune a lot, which is expensive, takes time, and so on. On the other hand, maybe using these adaptive step sizes, you don't need to worry about anything and get roughly the same performance or much better. Okay. Okay, in some sense, we also discussed that hey, before we said that maybe for deep neural networks or anything else, I should maybe add different features or different step sizes for different features, right? Turns out we can also do it here, where I can just change, change this norm to some weighted Euclidean norm. And then turns out this is my new polar step size where I can somehow use some kind of scaling. Okay. You can see I will use different features or different learning rate for different features, you know, basically by this matrix of vector V. And also I need to change this norm a little bit to make it work. Okay, so basically in this case, we have this adaptive uh, polar step size scaling, cool. Also something else what we can do, we can also maybe add some curvature because again, like you can think about why using this linear model, is it the best or not? Turns out it's not the best. Maybe what we can somehow do, can maybe modify this constraint, again, add the scaling is fine, but maybe use this kind of Hessian information or approximation duration, okay? It turns out if you do it, we may even much better, okay? Again, in this case, this is a little data logistic, blah, blah, blah. You can see Adam with three different step sizes, very different performance, right? In this case, what I will do, I will just try to use this polyac step size, which is adaptive, also adding curvature, and now it's even much better, okay? Again, no tuning, you can just try to plug it in, run it, it's almost perfect result. How much time do I have? Minutes or so. oh, okay, okay, so I guess maybe we'll spend some time on different approach. So basically different idea could be reducing the variance of the stochastic gradient, okay? And actually very nice recent works about from Saga, uh, Tong Zhang, basically SVRG, also basically me and my co-authors of, uh, about Saga paper. So basically imagine this one, what if my variance, I can somehow define stochastic gradient differently such that the variance of the stochastic gradient will be bounded by the suboptimality, okay? If this happens, why this should be good? Because now I can really bound the sigma square here by this quantity, some constant, and fx minus f star, and then I will obtain that every iteration expectation, I decrease the gap by some constant, okay? For example, this is a SAR algorithm, but I can sound do, I can define this stochastic gradient differently. I will start with the full gradient or some good estimate, that's a large mini batch, and then update recursively my stochastic gradient as follows, okay? Imagine, imagine if this is like the full gradient, a W0, on expectation, this should be almost like the full gradient, a W1, okay? And so on and so on. So basically, if I have this property, for example, you can sh also show that, first of all, the stochastic gradient actually will be shrinking down to zero quite fast. You can see the performance is not really very random, like, like for HGD or for Adam, but it's much more smooth, right? So basically, in this case, maybe I can do also something much more fancy. Because still, for Sarah, there was some kind of step size here, hidden, right? Same as HGD and Adam. But maybe because it's somehow smooth, I can maybe make it adaptively without tuning anything. Turns out it's possible. And so I'm going to describe this in this paper where I can maybe try to run this Adam, so it's a size with different big step sizes. It's terrible. Small step size means I'm very slow. Large step size means I can even diverge. 
but I can also use this adaptively, intelligently, implicitly, and basically in this AI saga, it's almost like perfect, right? It's beating everyone. And also actually the step size in this case doesn't decrease, but actually increases. You could never really find out that sometimes the step size can be even like 72. Because only 16 here was divergent, right? So actually you will never find out if you some had to do some hyperparameter research that maybe later on the step size would increase and that's it, okay? Okay, the different ideas what you can somehow do. One could be trying to adjust the mini batch in runtime. Maybe someone think, okay, I'm stuck, maybe increase mini batch and so on. Could be also basically think about different ways how can I increase <laughs> or adjust this learning rate. And also basically this like very nice blog from Francesco Rabona about speaking about how can I really just make some connection between uh, coin flipping and betting to HGD and step sizes. And also there are some different challenges, basically what can we do if I have let's say min-max game or reinforcement learning as we said before in the talk, okay? So thank you very much. I think I finish on time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Let me start. So okay. there are many different optimizers, and in the end, I think in practice, people are just using standard SGD. Uh, <laughs> I don't think of this. Uh, actually, I don't think so, because actually there are some applications in physics we are working on, or chemistry, and HGD doesn't really work. Uh, actually, I also worked with some guys from actually uh, civil engineering, and actually it turns out Adam HGD was not working. We couldn't really tune it. We use actually some kind of fancy algorithms and we managed to train it in five minutes. Uh, they tried very hard to make it work in like one week, two weeks of training time, didn't help. Is it a special problem? There's a special problem uh, if someone connected to ODEs and PDEs and so on. Again, having HDD other was really infeasible. What about the standard machine learning problem? Like uh, again, or... standard, standard machine learning, you don't care. Right? You just use Adam, it's fine. No. But there are so many applications where standard, it's not really just image classification, doesn't. Once you do regression, basically once you get the once you need to get the real values, it's it's paid. How can you identify like, for which problem? So which uh, it's problem very easy. You, you try Adam, it works, fine. <laughs> <laughs> you try Adam, doesn't work. You try to tune, doesn't work, you know, into into do something smart. But again, like most problems which people are dealing with is fine. What do you did? Think of us. Yeah. It's, Adam was working, right? Because it was classical RL, right? For example. But, but I feel that that if we want to jump into RL for energy, like in the real world, probably we will need more solutions that are actually like this because I feel that it's also super sensitive to hyperparameter tuning. Like something basically was said before, let's say we have this random seed selection problem, right? Why? Maybe just use too large step size. I'm pretty sure if I use small step size, I wouldn't have the issue of this random seed. I'm pretty sure about this one. But again, no one really wants to use small step size because then it will take forever, right? But still, maybe I should somehow choose small step size at the beginning. Maybe it is later on, if I'm fine. Okay, but still, I think that many of those issues they describe in IL could be as a sequence or consequences of not choosing optimization algorithms properly. Uh, another question is, so in the case of deep learning, optimization and generalization are not independent. Yes. So if you have a, basically if you use a like, faster optimization packages, then it doesn't generalize. So like, like people sometimes prefer to use. Put it, put it, put it, put it. So if you have, use a like, faster convergence algorithm, then yes. it doesn't generalize. But it's fast. Okay. But there's different reasons for that. Uh, like fl flat minimum kind of. Uh, no, I don't. I, I think that there are some papers about this flat minima and signal method goes to very bad. I don't believe this. Uh, but nowadays people use like some like sharpness aware minimization. I know, I know. But again, again, those claims I think are not completely correct. Uh, I actually, if, even I spoke to some of the co-authors of, of these papers. I told them, hey, you are treating a little bit. So yeah, yes. So it's not really completely correct what they do. I see. Because you can still think that almost any minimum they find is not really like it, again, you always think about sharpness in this like 2D example, right? Yeah. But we know for sure almost any point you give me, 
I can always find a way to move without changing anything, right? Let's say I can rescale neural, you know, basically rescale the layers, right? Once I rescale them, I will get different generalization properties. Of course, I will. But still, you know, it's not really completely correct how they claim. We have to some paper about this one. No, it's very. But still, I think that optimization still is very important to uh, focus on. Any other questions or comments? Otherwise, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> well, great. So we, we, we are run out of time, yeah. but this is the end of the first day, and we continue having the workshop next morning. So please, please come to eight, nine, nine a.m. Yes, no, yeah, I'm a bit confused. <laughs> <laughs> Japan, it's three o'clock. <laughs> so then, see you tomorrow. Thanks, Thanks so much. Day.